What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Drunken Boxing Podcast. Today, my guest is Bill Matucci. Bill has over 46 years of martial arts training experience in various arts, starting early on with Taekwondo, Hapkido, and Western boxing. In 1992, he started training with the great Ted Wong, who was one of Bruce Lee's last personal students and training partners, and Bill studied under him until Ted's passing. Bill is also one of Ted Wong's first certified Jeet Kune Do instructors. Uh, Bill also further studied and researched Chinese martial arts, Tai Chi Chuan, meditation, and other practices, which helped him recover from injuries which were beginning to impede on his training. Beginning about 10 years ago, Bill started coming to Beijing annually to study under Lu Shengli, who is one of Wang Peisheng's disciples. Some of you might not have heard of Lu through his book, The Combat Methods of Taiji, Xingyi, and Bagua, which has been published in English and is quite popular. I met Bill online a few years ago and met him in person during one of his uh, many training trips to Beijing. We had a great discussion where Bill recounted his many experiences and stories related to his training and time with the different teachers in different styles. Without further ado, here is Bill Matucci. Okay, so welcome, Bill. Welcome to Beijing. Thank you. You landed it's good yesterday. Being here. Landed last night, huh? This, uh, yesterday afternoon. Okay, so um, I know you from uh, online from different. Chinese martial arts groups and Facebook groups and we became friends and we started chatting and uh, you've got an interesting story too because you've started training uh, before. I mean, you might as well give us your background. What, what got you into Chinese martial arts or where did you just, start? Just like uh, oh, most people were over Bruce Lee. Okay, you know, it's his fault. His fault again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, about 1973, I grew up in Pittsburgh in a steel town. Everybody's sort of tough. We were... Uh, as kids, we'd walk the streets with nunchakas and stuff like that. Oh, so nice. We're always got... Uh, so, Bruce Lee, uh, sort of something to connect with, you know? Especially since we're all sort of like juvenile delinquents a little bit, you know? Where did you get nunchucks then? Did you make them? We yourself? made Oh, yeah. Oh, we yeah made I was going to say. Brooms, handles, and stuff like that. And even though... And my father also made me a halfway decent pair. So, anyhow. Uh, so, I went to go to, to Chinese martial arts. But there was really none except for... Uh, Ed Parker, uh, Kempo, oh, Kempo, and there was a Tracy system they had, and uh, so I did that for a short time. Tracy, Tracy, Al Tracy was one of the Kempo guys. Oh, okay, okay. And I what he know. did is he sort of he was one of the first people to really market the Kempo. You know, right? They had the belt programs and everything like that. And about I think he learned in the beginning maybe uh, you know a hundred self defense techniques at a time and and the forms and so on. So. But uh, they were mostly into uh, doing a lot of point sparring, yeah. which was okay. But, you know, Bruce Lee, and uh, reading his books and so on, you know, he wanted to get to the real fighting and stuff. And, and Pittsburgh was a big, pretty big fight town. We had a couple good uh, uh, fighters, uh, Fritzy Zivic and uh, uh, I can't remember the other one. Uh, and, uh, what were they, boxers? They were boxers. Mm. And, they, and they fought, um, one fought Joe Lewis. So Wow. Uh, How so, did that turn out? Well, it was funny. He, he, he beat him almost every round, except for the last round, Joe Lewis knocked him out. Uh, well, sometimes that's, the, <laughs> that's the, the plan, you know? Yeah. yeah? So, um, like rumble in the jungle. Right. <laughs> so, so after that, I, uh, I heard from uh, one of my uh, classmates at school that there was a guy there. He was like, you know, he was a pretty badass. You know, he was a weightlifter, boxer, did martial arts. I mean, he was just all around. So I said, well, I want to go to him, you know, because that's like, you know, Bruce Lee's espousing, the sparring and so on like that, full contact. So I go to the school. It was Taekwondo, Hapkido, and boxing. So I go to the school, very, very small school, and uh, they did a class. And then uh, after the class, he got his senior black belts, and they put on the, uh, at that time, there was no sparring gear. So they wore the Taekwondo body armor, yeah. tennis shoes, boxing gloves, and a football helmet, all kind of <laughs> out, right? But uh, uh, I guess it was sort sort of abusive because our teacher was about weighed about two hundred and ten pounds, uh, natural good... athlete. We were all like about one hundred sixty, one hundred seventy pounds. So the football helmet so was the, on purpose, and it was spinning. Sometimes <laughs> you get so hit so hard that you'd be looking through the ear hole. You know? <laughs> so then after a while, you start to say, "I don't know if this is really protecting me or not." You know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we did that. So 
I was really into it, you know, going to school. Right after school, it wasn't too far from my high school. Go right down there. Well, like, how was he teaching? Was he just technique-based, form-based? No, no. We just do, we, It was just like part of class. You did your technique. You did your form. And then spar. Okay. You know, and, then it, and then it was different. You know, it was uh, a lot of Western boxing. You know, he, What do you think about that formula for training martial arts? Do you think it's a good formula? For? Like making sure that you do sparring every day oh absolutely yeah okay. absolutely and then the western boxing to me i always think has a lot of truth to it you know yeah you know you have you're balanced in it and and you're covered you learn how to move your body how to move your and to take shots as well as yeah. give shots you know so i think that was very important and i think that laid down a lot of uh my development mostly and that was one of the things that he did too, sort of he developed his own method, sort of like the Taekwondo people when they would uh, kick, they'd stand, you know, like much more upright. Yeah. And then people when they punch, they get real wide back then, you know. Yeah. So he sort of modified that we did everything out of more of a boxing stance. So that sort of was that's going progressive. Toward, right. That was, and that's like 19, at that time, that's about 1974, 75. So okay. He started, and again, he was a natural athlete. He could do... He could do anything. So uh, jump real high. I mean, he was probably only about uh, about five eleven, but he could jump uh, and kick a uh, basketball hoop. Oh, geez, that's pretty. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Pretty very, high. very, very athletic. And so, uh, so we started doing that. So, so about 1979, uh, our our grandmaster, uh, he had four schools and a martial arts supply house. So. Um, uh, he sold it. All, all this, all this, all was, in all, Pittsburgh. All, yeah, in, all Pittsburgh. in Pittsburgh. Yeah. So then, my teacher was teaching at those schools, and then when he left, he turned them over to him. Or actually, sold it to him, and and he asked me, "Do you want?" Because I was like, I was there every day, you know, training all the time. It's like they used to say, "Bruce Lee, you like crazy, like Bruce Lee." You know? Well, that's that what we call in <laughs> Chinese like wu chi, like a martial nut job. <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. right. You know, you're buying books, all kind of stuff. So. Uh, you're sleeping with headbands on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I went there. But I remember looking down at the bottom of my bed. I have like books all over the place. Yeah, know? Bruce Lee posters on the wall. Uh, so he, so, so, so I would teach. Uh, I teach half at, ni- at the night time. During the day, I would go to the university area and be in a martial arts supply store. Okay. So I got all the nuts from the tri-state area coming in. Okay. You know? So it was it was actually very good. I mean, I, I met people, and and from there, you know, because we were always in even even a lot of kung fu guys and everybody. The, everybody was into that sparring. This was sort of like a little more new, you know, trying to do more sparring. So I met uh, you know I met people, uh, good, good, you know, friends. They became friends uh, from the martial arts. They come to the store just to talk, and hmm. so I learned, you know, I learned some, uh, you know, penchats a lot, bondo. There wasn't a lot of kung fu, just a little bit. Um, but I did, I did have the fortunate uh, to meet two guys, um, and they were Westerners, but they could read and write and speak Chinese very well. Wow! In, in 1979, 1980, uh, one of them actually learned. Uh, he went to University of Pittsburgh, went to the language class, and then he went to the military and was a translator in the military. Oh, wow. So his Chinese got very good. He already had practiced before that. He had already practiced uh, uh, Japanese martial arts, so he was into it. So then when he went back to California uh, in the military, he met a woman who did Bagua Zhang. So then he started to practice that. There was a woman? So, there was a woman, and yeah, this was supposed to be like 1980. Wow, and then the, and then the other guy that I met, uh, he was a psychologist, and he was uh, he grew up around Silver Springs, Maryland, and his parents were in the diplomats. They were diplomats, so he learned. To, so this is very unique in the sense that you have two people that uh, can read and write and speak Chinese pretty good. And you met them at the store. And I met them at the store. Yeah. So this is like this is constant. You know, five six days a week, there would always be martial art people coming in. Uh, Asian as well as Westerners all the time. So and all the crazies too, you know, buying, yeah. buying the stores and the and the, and the, and the ninja stars. Games. Ninja, oh yeah, ninja was very big at that time. <laughs> too. So and, and, and you know, people with delusional ideas. And I, I'd say, well, where'd you learn that? Well, I learned it from my uncle, who learned it from this guy, who learned it from that guy. You know, there's always some bizarre story attached yeah. to it. You know, so. Uh, one of the things that I learned from them was, you know, they told me like, you know, uh, internal martial arts because their thing was uh, the one, the one that was from the diplomat. Uh, he did Shingi, Bagua, Taiji, uh, Baji, and he did a lot. One of his main training was in Tian Sun Pai, 
with a Willie Lynn. He oh, okay. was in Silver Springs, Maryland. Tenshan Pai, though, is, I mean, isn't that basically and just a mix Taiwan, up? Taiwan, yeah, it's like a mix. Like, it's, I don't know if it's exactly. Yeah, because I've been trying to read, uh, and there was that whole debacle online where it came out that it seemed like the whole thing was, was made up. Was made up, <laughs> right. right. And they were teaching some of the Nanjing Guoshu forms, and they were right. teaching some of the right. mainland, right. Uh, right. more modern forms, and mixing it with things right. here and there. But this guy, you said he was doing Xingyi Bagua and Taiji, but right. where was he learning those? Did he learn them? He, over? he learned them, actually, there was, there was two guys from Tian, uh, that were in the tent. There was Willie Lin that was in Tianzhen Pai, and then there was another guy that came over. His name, uh, his name was Lu, and uh, he, had, he did that separately. From oh. the Tianzhen Pai. Okay. So he was there. And uh, so and one of the things, uh, the, the, he actually was the one who taught me, one of the first things he taught me was like, he said, well, since you do karate, and you know, he had it very much like, you know, Chinese martial arts, much superior to everybody else, uh, you know, uh-huh. this type of thing. So he said, since you do that, you need to practice like the Tianzhen Pai form, Baji form. And then he started to teach me some uh, splitting and crushing, you know. He said, these are the first things. P-Tren. P-Tren and Bung Tren. Yeah. Yeah. So that you could just develop a a different type of body feel for the way you move, right? So uh, it was okay at the time, but, you know. Was his Xingyi considered Taiwan? uh, I don't really know. At that time, I don't really know. know. I know he was very much, uh, he liked Sun Sun Lutong, and and I remember some of the stuff now going back. He'd do his more like, you know, like this. Uh, Okay. His splitting. He'd go like, you know. More More opening, more like that. Yeah, like that, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but one of the things I did learn from them is they, you know, they sort of gave me an insight on, how to learn from someone who's Asian, you know, the, oh, okay. the protocol, Good. Uh, what to look for as far as like, especially that, you know, people were making stuff up. Right. And uh, one, and they both told me, it's like, if you don't find a good instructor, just don't even do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? They said, you don't want to develop bad habits. You don't want to. So I kept that for, I always kept that uh, philosophy in mind. But so, how would you know though as a beginner? Yeah, you sort of, well, if somebody looks good, I mean, I mean, good, correct body feel, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, even though as a beginner in the Chinese martial arts, I practiced regular martial arts long enough, I, okay. I, knew, I knew how people should move, right? Right. If they're tripping and falling and no power. Right, sort of, right. You know, and people... The, you know, the problem today is that like, especially with a lot of the performance-based right, Chinese right. martial arts, a lot of people mistake that for mastery you know what i mean so right um that that sometimes uh sometimes is difficult for people to see and they'll say okay this guy's an ex-professional athlete and he does shingy and would you think it looks right because it's fast and flashy and whatever but that's all he knows he just knows one routine he doesn't know the system he doesn't know how to use it and in fact if you ask a real deep shingy person he'll tell you that there's problems with Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. most of the methods that they are using so it's hard sometimes i think must have been even harder in your days oh yeah yeah because you don't have the internet because it was yeah you didn't have any internet we were buying the books that were, you know, the Chinese books that were uh, uh, bootlegged in Hong Kong and Taiwan. We're looking through those little them, ones, those little tiny ones, yeah. you know, and uh, you know the old Shingy ones and the other uh, other and the, and the Bagwan ones, the classic ones, Sun Lutong's and. Uh, but you know, one thing about Sun Lutong's Shingy book, it was most probably what we consider one of the first, if not the first, published books right, on right, Shingy right, Chen. Right, 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 right. But even to today's standards. It's a really well written book, mm. and and that's you know that's probably why his book is one not just because it was one of the first, right. why it's still so popular is because it was written so well. Mm-hmm. So look, he did he did put in a whole lot of uh, esoteric esoteric types. stuff in there, but uh, and some of it wasn't before a lot of the connections he 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 made. He right, made. Right, right, right. But in terms of the Xingyi and uh, the technique wise, his explanations were mm-hmm. clear, good. Mm-hmm. It had photos, which must have cost a fortune back then. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that was uh, probably one of the first ones that were. Yeah, one that of the had first. photography, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I, uh, but uh, then again, you know, I go, so I start uh, at this time now, Dan and Asanto, he's starting to teach, doing seminars and so on like that. So. There was a group of us that would just follow him around a little bit to learn the JKD. I'm still doing Taekwondo, still doing all these other things. Again, do, you know, do you know what kind of Taekwondo it was? Uh, we were with uh, not the, yeah, the ITF. 
ITF. ITF. So it's yeah. North Korean based. Right, right, right. They were real close to you know General Choi. You know. General Choi, yeah. So I mean, a lot of people don't know about the the differences. I mean, it all basically started with General Choi and a few yeah, guys. Yeah, making it up. Yeah, yeah so. but I mean, the whole Taekwondo thing was General Choi, and that was the system that he made, and mm -hmm. it kind of got hijacked from him. Right, right, right. So right, it got right, hijacked right. from him by people in the government right, in the right, south, right, and right. and that's why he, he was not actually North Korean. But the North Korean government said, we'll support your Taekwondo. Right, right. So he, he allied with them later on to keep ITF right. going. And ITF moved its headquarters there. Right. And he taught them there. And, you know, he, he I mean, his guys were... The guys that he was teaching were full-time training. Right, right, and right, they right, were right. hard men. Right, right, right. I mean, any anytime you train something like that so hard for so long, you're going to become really right, skilled. Right. And they were skilled. Well, yeah, that, that, that was like... A some of the first tournaments when I did Taekwondo, we only did Taekwondo tournaments. Yeah. And uh, some of the masters that we saw, I mean, they were, I mean, phenomenal. I don't know how good they could really fight or whatever, yeah. but they were phenomenal. And as far as like just doing a simple like reverse punch, you see it, it cracked. And it yeah. was, they were right on. And to be able to jump, kick two legs out this yeah. way. Not the, now, nowadays they got even more 300, you know, 540 degrees and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of their stuff was, and some of them was a little bit more, a little more of a wind up. But if it would hit you, it would kill you. you well, know, I know. don't know if you've read a book called The Killing Art. Yeah, you? yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, those guys, some of them became hitmen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Barehanded killers for government agendas. <laughs> yeah. So assassins. Assassins, they yeah. They kidnap people, right. Koreans from the United States, all over the world, really. So I think their art does work. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it has to be trained in a specific way. Yeah, I think yeah, I think the, the direction of the more sportified version is kind of diverged right, from that. Right, and right, that's right. The, the key difference right. between... ITF and, right, and right. WTF. Yeah, and that's what we did. I mean, we, we drill, block, yeah. punch, block, punch, you know, stuff like that. I remember one of the things that, that actually stick into my mind this day is like, you know, the idea of an indomitable spirit, you know. Yeah. And my teacher one time, he told me like, uh, you know, what you have to be able to do is if you're walking down the street and there's somebody like here, they have a two by four and you're going down an alley and they're bent on hitting you with it and you don't know, he said, you got to be able to hit, get hit as you're as you're being knocked out, that you still have that ability to throw that punch, you know, that <laughs> have didn't. that spirit and still hit them, you know. Right. And uh, I think some of those guys probably could have, you know. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, I they had so that too. mindset, you especially know? the older generation. They were very hard, man. Hard, hard, yeah. hardcore guys. Yeah. So you started following Dan Santa around. Dan Santa doing the, and, and and it was funny, you know, we we wanted the JKD, the Wing Chun stuff, but you know, sort of got hijacked a little bit with the college and that <laughs> yeah. stuff. And some of the Muay Thai stuff, and we liked it. I mean, again, we're, we're all like martial arts junkies, you yeah. know what I mean? So if it's new and had, and it did have a lot of it had application, and and you could, and the thing about the way, and he did a lot of like Western boxing drills mostly, yeah, you know? yeah. and you could tie that in together. So it was good, but you know, it's sort. Of, I always felt that it sort of lacked because even though my uh, my first teacher who uh, who didn't have all that super flash, you know, the, yeah. the wink chun stuff, like that, he he. he, he He'd probably beat most people at that time. It wouldn't matter, you know what I mean? Well, you what they knew, that. he was just one of those very good athlete, had high, good boxing skills. He was going to turn professional, and uh, you'd have to kill him. You know, that was the thing there. You know, so. Well, you know, um, I don't know if you know uh, when uh, Jigoro Kano started sending his uh, Kodokan instructors to the States and other countries to, to, start, spreading, uh, to start spreading judo. Sometimes they had some matches with wrestlers in the States and even football players. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes they lost to, to a football player mm -hmm. just based on pure force, strength, right. athleticism. Exactly. So that makes a big difference. Oh, that you makes know? a big difference. Right? Absolutely. So, uh, so it, it sort of didn't have that feel to it, you know. And I, like I said, I've seen a lot of guys, but I said, I, they couldn't beat this guy, you know. Yeah. There was something about, the, and, and to me, it, was, it always went back to the Western boxing. And again, the Taekwondo, hardcore Taekwondo, you put it, you have that, um, you've modified it enough that you have good mobility with yeah. the Western boxing. The ability to take a punch as well as give a punch, be able to be able to fight inside, outside. And uh, as long as you're not doing a lot of flashy kicks, taking you off of your uh, your balance and so on you know 
Yeah, got a pretty good system. So I didn't really see that out of anybody too much. So, so it's a, you, you, you won two. Uh, I mean, you enjoyed the I teaching? I enjoyed it, but it wasn't just like overly, you know, it wasn't okay. like, it was something. <laughs> then I'm reading the books on Bruce Lee and the one book that come out with Jesse Glover, you know? Yeah. Starting to go and they talk about him practicing Shingi, Bagua, Taiji, uh, Tongbe, uh, uh, what else? Um, Southern Manus. I said, there's a, a Chinese martial art somehow in there again. So you start looking for this stuff again, right? Right. Meanwhile, and at the same time... Did you ever meet Jesse Glover? Uh, yes, one time I met him. Okay. Yeah. You know, do you know the, the last guest on this podcast, uh, Luke Benza uh, from Gabon? Uh-huh. He was an, he's an actor, and he played Jesse in, uh, oh, in, the, in, Bruce in, in, in the Bruce Lee story. In the Bruce Lee story. That's an interesting connection there. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So that he had a lot of things in there. And, and again, he was going, and when I was reading the book, it was, you know, in Bruce Lee's early development where he'd work a technique over and over and over again. He was very big into that, only having a certain amount of techniques. So it goes back to boxing. It only has five hand techniques. Exactly. You know? So you go back, and again, it's that simplicity, right? So, uh, again, you're searching for the uh, JKD. So I, I learned off their other JKD after the Anasante stuff because it was always like t- Muay Thai, sticks, Wing Chun. So I, I just wanted the JKD thing, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I wasn't very interested. You know, double sticks, you know, stick and knife. I'm not thinking that's going to happen in me, you know, especially the U.S. It's going to usually be gun, you know. So You're not going to be walking around with a stick and a knife. Stick and a knife, you know. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I trained under uh, Jerry Poteet for a period of time. Wow. And uh, I uh, also did some training under Dan Lee. And then it just so happened, a friend of mine, uh, we both trained under uh, Jerry Poteet, and he went out to California and he met with Ted Wong. And uh, that's uh, 1992 that Mm -hmm. I met with Ted Wong. And and just, uh, just the first time I seen him, I seen him move in, he had the footwork, he moved like a lot like Bruce Lee, Ted Wong, right? And then he had all the things that I was reading about, non-telegraphic punch, Punch coming from where it's at, straight line, all this stuff, footwork, mobility, using, and I'm like, I can't believe it. It was like, I was sold right where there. Where was Ted Wong based on? He was in California. Oh, okay. And we were bringing him in for seminars <coughs> on the East Coast, and then a group of us got together, about four of us got together, and then we would just, you know, we would support each other. I would bring him in, uh, you know, I'd bring him in, and then the other three guys and their students, they would come up, and then... Uh, and then we just support each other. We kept, you know, training. So that was that was really a great experience. And then Ted, over the course of time, you know, he would have what he would teach in the group class or in the seminar class. Then he'd have us because uh, we'd have him come in a couple of days ahead of time, mm-hmm. teach classes. But what he taught us there, it wasn't uh, it wasn't the same thing he was teaching in the seminars, right? So anyhow, later on, uh, this is going a little bit ahead, but later on he. Uh, I started to see him one time. He started to teach some of the stuff, same stuff that he was teaching us. We, said, we always thought that was like the secret stuff. Right. right. And I said, uh, I said, Ted, how come you're uh, teaching that now? And he said, uh, he said, I used to think it was secret, but if they don't practice, it's still a secret. So yeah, that was yeah. his thing, you know. But again, his thing was the Western boxing, and the fencing, uh, and just the modifications that Bruce Lee did for the leading straight punch and, and certain things like that. Using your body, you know, using your body, pushing off the ground, never stepping. Anytime you hit, you're pushing. A little bit like Xing right? Yeah, 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 right? yeah. So it had some of those fun, uh, some of those things in it. So about 1999, I started to feel like a little twinge in my hip, right? Mm. So the oldest time you'd been focusing on Jeet Kune Do? Jeet Kune Do, yeah, Jeet Kune Do. Going in and out every once in a while, I'd see a Tai Chi class because yeah. in uh, Pittsburgh there was like uh, uni- uh, Carnegie Mellon University stuff like that. So we get a lot, especially at that time, a lot of the mainland Chinese, right. especially at Carnegie Mellon, they're coming, they're going there. So they would set up like a Tai Chi class, and just like, how the hell are you gonna make this stuff work? That was my whole thing. And uh, later on, I found out. A lot of these guys were just doing like the Beijing 24 form right. and stuff like that. But they were pretty good at it, you know what I mean? They might have been, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't, they didn't do the Wusu. I think they were more maybe a collegiate type of athletes or something like that. Well, know? I mean, people don't know that when 24 came out, it became so popular in China. Right, right. And everyone, a lot of people were practice, practicing right, right, it from right. all walks of life. Right, right. They were just doing it, some of them just for the sake of doing something. Right. Something so it was right. pretty well spread. They didn't right, have, right. They, they could have been nobodies, you know, right, they could have right. been uh, garbage collectors and right, they were still right, doing right. it. Everyone was doing it. So, uh, so I go back. So, so then, about 1999. So yeah, we're doing a lot of still sparring, a lot of hard sparring. 
I'll go back, I'll digress a little bit, but uh, when my teacher, uh, one, one time when, uh, on Saturdays, we used to teach, uh, when my teacher did Taekwondo, uh, one time we were there, what we do is Saturday be a hard sparring class, right? So, this is when I started to figure out, hard sparring is not always good for you. So, <laughs> it's not, so it's sparring class. So I remember that that weekend, because we took a lot of shots. We never hit him, and he, you know, basically. This was your old teacher. This was my old teacher. Yeah. We pound the hell out of yeah. us, right? So I turned the water on to take a shower, and the water went on my head, but I didn't feel it. Uh oh. Oh yeah. So I said, "Wow." And then what we would do? Were you still wearing the football helmet? No. <laughs> no that's how we graduated to a little bit less. So. Uh, so all of a sudden, you know, a group of us got together. We'd go down. We'd go down, have a couple beers at a bar after, and have lunch. And then I noticed, I said, you know, we don't really start talking. We're there about an hour. We're sort of like grunting. And, like, oh, no. mm. and not to about an hour, we just start fine. I said, you know what? I think us, we're taking too many shots. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I was getting a little older. I was getting, you know, getting closer to you know, 28 years old. Yeah, you know, and and you start starting to feel that, and then at that time too, uh, I I couldn't make. I was teaching. I really wasn't able to make a lot of money, so I started going back to college, and then the kickboxing. You get maybe paid five hundred bucks at the most, you know, for something like that. So you start to see where you know it starts to feel the the damage that you're taking now is more. So anyhow, going back to that, the JKD I think helped prolong. My time. Actually. Was this? Training. Did you guys spar in JK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We still, yeah, we still sparred. In fact, when I moved back to Pittsburgh, and I went to a boxing gym, one of my students, he uh, he was always into boxing. He was a police officer, and he uh, actually organized the police athletic league pal uh, in there. So he had a gym up in a uh, it was a, a county park, hmm. and a lot of the boxing gyms in Pittsburgh had closed down. Yeah. So we had these old time Italian trainers, and they were up there. So we had pros. We had pro kickboxers, amateur kickboxers, pro boxers, amateur boxers. Yeah. And we would train there due to JKD and stuff like that. And we had every piece of equipment you could imagine. Oh, that's nice. You know, and we had people to hold the gloves properly, and and the old boxing oh, the trainers mitts, yeah. to give the you know train properly and so on, and give us the right tips. So yeah, so it's all, Western boxing has always been something I think. It has a lot of truth to it, you know. It does it's, definitely. You know, I mean, there's. It's from day one focused on one thing. You're gonna so spar. You're gonna spar. That's right. it. Yeah. You're gonna get hit. Hopefully, you don't get hit as much as you hit him. So, yeah. Like that. And you have to be in shape. Yeah. You know, I always think of the platform. You know, no matter what you sort of do, it's like, you know, you're always like, you do your warm up, you do your, you know, jumping rope, you're doing that, and then you're doing your shadow boxing. Yeah. Right? And then you're hitting the mitts, and yeah. you're going to hit the back, and then you're going to do some sparring. Yeah. So I, I think those those five elements are important as far mm -hmm. as your training methods are concerned. Right. No matter what martial art you're doing, you have some type of warm up, some type of hitting something. Yeah. You know, and then there's some free practice. You right. Know, as far as sparring. So again, going back to this, uh, see for war. So in about 1999, I started to feel that, you know, my hip starting to hurt a little bit. And I say, and I try to tell people now, you know, that was one of the things. We used to take the bag, we used to swing the bag, and hit it hundreds of times, you know, doing yeah. side kicks. I don't think that's good for you because you're probably your hip bone is smashing right into that yeah. socket like that right. every time. So, but yeah, a lot of Taekwondo guys have hip replacements. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. And it's from that. From that. Yeah. yeah. So I started, and I said, you know what? I bet you know what, maybe this Tai Chi stuff I better start doing. Really. So, <laughs> now suddenly it makes sense. <laughs> now it's making sense. Especially since I, I always thought, Shingy, Bagua, you know, Tai Chi, too slow. Yeah. So uh, a friend of mine who I knew, he, he was a Bondo guy that we used to do a lot of sparring together. And I knew he was doing Tai Chi. And I knew if he was doing Tai Chi, he was going to be training with someone good, you know. Mm. So i called him up and i said oh, he said so he made an introduction to this the teacher and i said oh i, I want to do that shingy bagua stuff you know so i asked the guy but i always used to think from oh you got to do the tai chi first you know you're not you're not eligible to do bagua or shingy you know? before tai that was the man that was the mental thing uh, right, right it's a so strange it's a strange almost, process yeah so i went there, oh yeah okay so then i was learning that a little bit and then uh 
I, so I went to one, I, I learned most of, I, actually most of my training, other than my Taekwondo training in the beginning, I've always been privately, you know, which is, I always think was is good. It accelerates people's training. Yeah, because you're, you're not waiting for everyone to play catch up. You're no, no, progressing no, at the speed no. and based on your abilities. So, right. so I, I was doing private. So I went to a group class and in the group class he was doing uh, uh, 37 uh, posture form, Wu style. And I saw I said, yeah. And that hips hurt me. That part was even hurt me now. No, right. You know, turning in like this and so on. So uh, I, I, I said, well, maybe I saw I start doing a Tai Chi. Then uh, 2001, I did have a hip replacement. Oh. Yeah, so I had a hip replacement. Which right hip? Right hip. Okay. That's the one that you swing and hit the back. With right. You. And it's, so it, it damaged me pretty good there. So. Uh, but did you find that the Tai Chi helped at all? Mm -hmm. it, it sort of, uh, what it did was it sort of like... Uh, it helped in a sense that, because I guess, you know, you're, you're not, you know, you're not bouncing around. You're not doing mm. that high impact as yeah. much like that. And you're still stretching mm. and stuff like that. In Taekwondo, I did a lot of stretching. But then when I started to do the JKD and do more sparring, I probably did not, you know. Stretch enough. Stretch enough, right. Okay. Right, right, right. right. Seems to be the case with a lot of people that start focusing on, uh, depending on what type of sparring they right, do. Right, right, right. That they, they, they focus less on flexibility. Right. And there's also that, that flip side of it where guys like start focusing more on muscular development. Right. And they don't realize that that's when you have to do even more stretching. Right, exactly. So it's an out of balance thing. And that's a lot of times too, from the 1970s to like 2000, those 30 years, all that athletic process has uh, really changed, you know. Even in football, the, the, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, people weren't even lifting weights hardly, you know. Yeah. I mean? And it just started in the 80s, people start figuring it out. So that's what I try to tell people now, you know, just the, the training, you just have to watch. So uh, so I got a hip replacement in 2001, still tried to do the JKD, doing the Tai Chi. I started to have problems with the ankles. Oh. And the ankles, I, I know that was probably from jumping and, and, and when we would train, we did, we trained on hard concrete floors, you know, and uh, so that I so I started feeling it in the ankles a little bit. So uh, I think around two thousand, yeah, two thousand ten, my uh, teacher actually uh, uh, Ted Wong passed away. You know, uh -huh. I was doing a little bit of Thai, I was doing a little bit of Tai Chi, and uh, still a little JKD. JKD was getting harder to do. Am I am I thinking correctly that Ted Wong was the first publisher of Bruce Lee's books? Was it Ted? No, Wong? no, no, he, no. He was uh, Ted Wong was actually Bruce Lee's uh, training partner and uh, last personal student of his. Oh, okay. So he I'm thinking of somebody else, and I don't think it it was a serious. Oh, Yuhawa? Yuhawa did the. He was the owner, uh, Mito Yuhawa was the owner of Black Belt Magazine, and he published the first Fightings Method, and Ted Wong was in those books. Yes, that's what yeah, I remember. He was in those. That's what I remember. So Ted sort of saw like the final development. The JKD that we sort of do, that, that Ted developed, was is much more, as Bruce Lee was trying to get on, was the formlessness stuff. You know? Right. It, there was hardly any Wing Chun at all in it. Right. You know? It was mostly, you know, moving and hitting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just his his way of moving and hitting was very unique, though it is different. It is different than the boxing. It is different. He modified a lot, and I, I think one of the things about him was, and we had just talked about this, was um, that he had, and I think Chinese martial arts sort of relates to some of this. It's the ability to the awareness of the body. I mean, I, I think what it was with him was he. Uh, I mean, he was a cha cha champion, and he had 110 different cha cha steps that he oh, knew yeah. okay so I mean if you had that body awareness and that talent because they did say as soon as he would see something he'd watch you do it he'd pick it up he'd train it in another week or two he'd be doing as good as you then later on he'd modify and go on I think that was just all the body awareness that yeah. he had so some of that unique thing, and he had that rhythm, timing, things that people like Muhammad Ali, stuff like that. Those things are almost like natural gifts, you know. That you but got. do you think that means that no one could actually do Jeet Kune Do the way he does it unless you have the same physical gifts? Nobody could do, they could do their own JKD, but they couldn't do it like his. Not like his. Not like his, right? You would have to sort of do it, you know. I, uh, there's a lot of structural things that I do the same way as Ted Wong, except I'm I'm six three and he was like five uh, five seven, right? Right. So so they're different, right? Uh, also, too, you got different strengths and weaknesses and so on. 
So the JKD, uh, you know, that was good. And then and so I started to do the Tai Chi more. And, and it was Wu style. Wu style, yeah. And and, and 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 my teacher was, you know, he was a student of Wang Pei Sheng. He was a teacher. yeah. And so he, he's a legit guy. To me, he's like the Bruce Lee of Chinese. And he person. was teaching where? Uh, in Pittsburgh. He okay. Was in Pittsburgh. What what took him there of all places? Uh, he uh, his wife. Uh, he's a computer programmer, and his wife, I believe, she's with usually a librarian with East West Studies. Mm. You know, so she was there. So they were both in the U.S. So he, he very he's very quiet. Well, he wrote several books. Yeah. Sort of thing. I mean that Taiji Classics book that that you sent me. Right, is, right. His, it's a it's a it's very a, well put together book. Right. Well, that's how he thinks too. You know. That's a, well, he's a programmer, right? Right. He's a programmer. I I think he was also he did some uh, teaching in, in China, so he has that mind. You know. Yeah, I think he's it's that, a very yeah, clearly structured, structured logical mind. Yeah. So. so you know. But what I liked about his book is that it presents the. Um, the original text, right. a translation, and then his explanation. Right. You know, right. and that's that's basically what I was doing. What I'm still finishing on my Xingyi book, but that was the way that I had structured it as well. Mm-hmm. Because it, it, it's it's one thing to translate. Right. It's another thing to translate and explain, and then it's another thing to translate, explain, and then also say how it how it manifests in your training. You know, right. Uh, right. based right. on your experience, and those are all valuable insights right. because. I mean, face it, those classics there, if you just read the classics on their own, it's not a very big or very, it's not such a gigantic treatise. Right, right. You know, I mean, you sit there and you think, but is that it? You know, is that it? But there is a lot to it. There is a lot to it. Yeah. Especially for a Westerner, the way he did it for us, who don't speak Chinese and read and write it, um, he he makes it a lot more. And you're thinking, ah, that, I get it now. It's a little bit more like I don't think we mentioned his name yet. Oh, Zhang Yun. Oh, Zhang Yun, yeah. yeah. So, he, uh, um, so yeah, his books are very good. And then his, uh, so when I started to come to Beijing and what was that? Is he still uh, teaching? Yes, he still teaches. He still has in good, Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, and then see, he's he lived in uh, uh, Princeton, New Jersey, and he lived in uh, Las or, or Reno, Nevada. He lived there, so he has students still there, and they still. Okay. And they, and they still train. He has a. I, I go to the seminar usually in uh, New Jersey, and he ha- usually has one too in uh, Maryland. Silver Springs, Maryland. He has a group. He has a couple groups. So I'll go to some of the seminars there. And he's. Uh, and he's teaching only Tai Chi. No, he teaches uh, Tai Chi, Xingyi, Bagua, Tongbei. All of Wang Pei Sheng. Yeah, all of Wang Pei Sheng stuff. Yeah, and he teaches that. And uh, the, and he was there first before he was Pittsburgh. But he has he has a great following. I mean, mm. and because. He's very good at what he does, and he's very precise, and there's no extraneous... And he can explain it clearly, explain obviously. It clearly. Yeah. I think part of it, too, was that he, he's always had t- uh, students that were in the university area, educated. So over the course of time, they sort of helped him bridge the, the gap between mm-hmm. his Chinese and then, and then you know, from learning that, said, oh, well, you can say this in English. This is a little closer. So, yeah. And he's yeah. learned that over the course of time, so... It's really it's it's unbelievable. I, I can't when he when he talks and, and like how his book is about. You know, he takes a lot of the uh, what people were thinking, like like uh, like the origins. Like he he won't say, well, this is what I believe. It's like, yeah. well, this is one of the this is one of the things that people say about it. This is another one. Right. Here's another one that you know generally people think this is the more accurate one. Mm-hmm. This is the one I think. You know, right. most of the time, a lot of people just give an opinion. See, I like how he does it. He just presents But the also facts. he's got the cultural knowledge right, to explain right. some, exactly. because that's the other thing a lot of people don't realize in the study of these arts is that, especially if you're looking at old texts, there's cultural understanding that's in there that if you don't have that cultural understanding, it's you're not going to understand why right, certain right. things were said. Well, I think what it is too is he's pretty highly educated. Even, uh, even though he's... I mean, just because he's Chinese doesn't mean he would understand some of that stuff. Either. No, no, I mean, right, that's right, what I'm saying. Right, right, right. That's right, what I'm saying. Right. I mean, I've got most of the, the, I mean, like I'm busy writing uh, on the on the Xingyi classics. Mm-hmm. And if I give the, the text to most average Chinese people today, mm-hmm. they have no clue. What, I mean, they can read the characters. They have no clue what the, what's being said there. They, 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 it's not only contextually not understanding... They're not understanding it technically from a <laughs> Xingyi point of view. And half of them don't understand the cultural background that right. was then, you right, know, right. Or, or the medical background that was imbued in, which was also connected to the cultural mentality because that's another thing. I mean, the the cultural 
understanding of that time included whatever philosophies were popular at that time at that time whatever level of understanding of medicine and physiology was understood at that time and which words they used to explain it right. and then the martial side of it so it's hard even for chinese people right exactly so, yeah and then uh i i started to come to uh i went with a tour with a bunch of martial art guys they were going to go to uh, shaolin temple and uh, i knew this guy and which so, year was this this was in 2012 okay so when I was there, I, I, I talked to Zhang Yun. I said, um, I know that Master Lu is in Beijing. I'd like to meet him, you know. So he set it up, and so I, I met him that time. Well, uh, what's the relationship between him and they're uh, uh, both uh, Wang Peisheng students. Okay, Lu Shengli. Uh, yeah, Lu Shengli. Yeah, they're, they're, they're disciples of uh, Wang Peisheng. Right. How did you know about Lu? Uh, from the book, from the book, and other, okay. and the other, you know. And he's on his website too. They, there's uh, there's about five of them that are. Uh, that were disciples of one patient they stay pretty close together okay so, um and then and then when uh when zhang yun would have some of his students they come to beijing and learn master lu was there he teached something okay like so they have that closeness about it that's right? good yeah what's nice about it too it's almost like the story of uh one patient learning from his his teacher yang yu ting he got to a certain level yang yu ting took him to his teacher Okay. You know, a Wang Mo's eye, right? So they don't have that thing, oh, I, I'm a teacher, you don't learn from this guy. Well, you I know. mean, we have it in my family too. Like my teacher, sometimes guys want to learn some uh, China. Mm -hmm. So then he'll say, okay, you go to my, my big brother, Zhao Dayuan. And Zhao Dayuan has the same thing sometimes when guys, his students want to learn some Xing Yi, then they come to us. Right, and, right, right, right. You know, because it's a different speciality. Right. I and mean, they're Bagua brothers, but right, yeah, right. yeah. That's how, yeah, that's how people learn, yeah. right? So then I met him there, and then I, I, he, he showed me the. Uh, he had a 20 posture form he had developed. He teaches that... Lu Shengli uh, developed. Lu, yeah, he's, uh, he teaches at Intel China. And uh, so there are a lot of programmers See, and these, IT these, people. It's like, it's like uh, all of his Wang Peishan found like the Silicon Valley of, of <laughs> Beijing <laughs> and he's got them as his students. <laughs> so, uh, so he developed this 20 posture form. Basically, it's like the 37 posture except uh you know there's no uh, he took a, more or less took the kicks out the name of the form i think is like wuxi uh fa wu family best postures why did he take the kicks off uh, i think more for uh just for the people to learn it and then what okay. happens is is that he's teaching it on the campus and then uh then when the students are interested they then become indoor students, and then they learn the other stuff. Okay. So that's sort of how. That's it good. It's like an initiation version of the right. the system. Right. right. So I learned that, and then I just was at that time. My body was just starting to, you know, feel the pain. You know, uh, getting closer to sixty years old. I'm sixty two now, or sixty one now. Uh, so I said, I said, man, this, I, I got. And what was really funny too was, uh, you almost get that feeling when you start practicing, and, and you get a good teacher. It's almost like you get that, that you get revitalized. Yeah, you, you get, become young again. You get, you know, Suddenly you get old, anxious. And yeah. You want to learn, and it's just like but, you get that mentality but, again. You go, wow, I haven't, haven't felt this in a long time. So I was re you become, then you become another uh, Tai Chi addict, you know. Generally. Right. Like, so. so now you're not crazy about Taekwondo. It starts all over again. You've got all the Tai Chi books <laughs> under your bed. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, so then now I've been coming to Beijing for the last stuff uh, since 2012. I come about twice a year. That's good. And then learn privately from him. And then his students come, but uh, most of them are from Intel China. So they do the uh, interpret, you know, they, they do the translating for me and so on like that. So, nice. Well, so I mean, nice. You, you, you stay with him when you train. I stay with him, yeah. That's yeah, very good. Right, right. I mean, there's not many teachers that are, that do that right. anymore. They're very right. non-personal. Right, right. But right. You, the, the people don't realize that the only way to get the deeper uh, way of training is to have a personal relationship with, right. uh, with, with a teacher. I'm always impressed, too, because when I come there, I'm always like, uh, uh, like he said, what do you want to learn? I said, well... I like to learn this, right? I, it, would, it wouldn't really matter to me what, you know. But by the time I leave, I know. I mean, he really, I mean, pretty much a taskmaster that you're you're practicing. You know, we get up in the morning, we practice, we get some breakfast, we train for about two hours, take a yeah, break, drink yeah. some tea, practice another two hours, then go take a nap, then wake up. That's okay. That's that's good. Yeah, that's yeah. how you do. You just keep, you can't train eight hours a day. That's what, like, people, when they go through that, oh, I train six, eight hours a day. I said, I said, if you're really practicing hard, you're no. not practicing that long, right? Yeah. So, 
anyhow, but it's, uh, and you know, after that, after I'm there a week or so, you know, you're getting 40, 50, 60 hours of private lessons, you know, yeah. so I go back home and you practice it again. And, you get, I have a couple of uh, uh, people at home that I work with to do the push hands right, and stuff right. like that. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, it's a lot of fun now. So You it, never it, did any other Tai Chi except for Wu style? No, I did uh, I did some uh, the Beijing 24 form. Okay. I did a little Sun style stuff. And but I really like the Wu style stuff. Yeah, but they, what is it for you that, that, that makes The Wu style, the thing, it, it, it reminds me of Western boxing. I mean, short stance, you yeah. know? Hands inside, sort of close, intercepting. Yeah, yeah it's, it makes a lot of sense, you know. The Wu style, you're not, and, and and that, you know, because you're in a little bit shorter stance. To me, you're using a lot more of your internal strength more than your real physical. The real long stance, you got to get momentum, yeah. get out of it, and move. Right, the Wu style, you sort of, so you sort of glide. You know what I mean? Yeah, you have that. You but, know, it's one of the not, not, I mean, outside of China, it's not one of the more well known Taiji styles or well known. Especially the Northern Wu, right? Yeah. But here in Beijing at the turn of the century, it was more popular than the Yang style. Yeah. That's a funny thing. I mean, it's so strange when I go, everybody knows Yang style, mm -hmm. they know Chen style, and they know the, the, the methods, but when, when you show them Wu style, most of them are put off by it. Right. Because it's small, it doesn't have a very, what you would consider in terms of, what they know to be beautiful and right. expanded open postures like right, in right, right. Yang style that doesn't have those. Right. But when you've got an experienced martial arts mind, when you look at that, you're like, okay, well, that makes sense now. You right, know? right, right. It makes much more sense than the open, fully extended, uh, right. you know, and yeah, that, uh, it's... Yeah, it is. And then, and then a lot of the Wu style that you see uh, in, uh, in the U.S. is mostly the Southern Wu. You yeah. Know? The Wu Qian Chuan that he yeah, went yeah, yeah. to... Uh, Shanghai, and then later on, I moved down there. So the Northern Wu, and I think that's what's unique about the Northern Wu was that it stayed in Beijing, and we talked about this before. Yeah. There's something about Beijing and Beijing martial arts. Right. That it was the capital, and people came here, and if you weren't good, I mean, someone was going to come and fight you. You know. Yeah. Well, you weren't going to become well known. Well, no. <laughs> no. And no one's going to come and learn from you either. No. No. So. no, no. And then I think sort of there was more, you know, you had the government, you had the more military. Shanghai, more the, especially in the 20s, you get more of the intellectuals. Yeah. This is when the health stuff starts coming out a little bit more. Yeah. So I think Beijing sort of had more of that. It kept some of that a little bit alive. Well, that's why, part of it. that's why Xing Yi is like so well known in Beijing and in China was because of the guys. If it stayed in Shanxi, it wouldn't have become such a big style. Mm -hmm. But it's because a lot of the guys came to Beijing and they came to Beijing and they became famous mm -hmm, in mm -hmm, Beijing. Mm -hmm. And it was based on their, you know, prowess and their abilities. And, and also, they weren't, they were simply, it wasn't just they were interacting with Xingyi people. When you come to Beijing, right, right. you're going to interact with all those other styles that are trying to make a name for themselves. Right, right. Or all those other people from those well, different, different styles. Right, and, right. and if you made a name here at that time, it means there's something there, you know. So... You know, it was, it was for, sort of funny, too, at those times. A lot of those guys, they cross-trained, and they didn't have these sort of attitudes that people have, like, later on. Like, they would learn, like, a lot of them did Swai Jiao, and yeah. they did the Bagua, they did the Xing Yi, they did the Tung Bei. They all had the, you know... So they were sort of doing their own JKD, in a sense. Yeah, they were. I mean, Shui Jiao is, is, was a common pastime here in right, Beijing. Right, right, right. I mean, the capital, it was a, uh, during the Qing Dynasty, it was one of the so-called professional sports. You could be a professional wrestler. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is where the imperial uh, court was, the, mm -hmm. uh, the Forbidden City. If you're going to be a wrestler to do demonstrations or performances or for public viewing or mm -hmm. make a living off of it, this is the this city, is Beijing. Like it, right? yeah. So even Shui Jiao was so popular here. And it still is to a degree although it's died out a, quite a lot right, recently right. but yeah so they did Shui Jiao they, they, they did other styles too they had connection and they had interaction with other people other so. people too right 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 so that's where open. that's where the Xingyi and Bagua crossover started right, happening right, and right, right. So that was more in Tianjin right some of that the more of that or that well too. both both I mean how 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 Tianjin and Beijing are, only, they're not far yeah, away from each other miles, so right. there's a reason why these two places right. have, have these uh permeation of these styles so yeah yeah i mean it's it's do you want a refill of your beer there sure okay let me pause okay we're back so cheers
Now that we've got yeah. refills. <laughs> what do you think of this beer? Oh, this beer is very good. Yeah. Where's it from? From here? From mm. I think it's an American oh, yeah. Goose yeah. Island, but now they've oh. started producing here. So it's, it's pretty easy to get. And it's a good IPA. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's very good. So uh, you, you started training with Lou. Do you still train with your old Wu style teacher when you're back home? Is that why I go to Pittsburgh sometime? Yeah, oh, because I, you're not based in Pittsburgh yeah, I'm, anymore. I'm in Florida now, and uh, my, uh, some of my children, uh, they moved back to uh, Pittsburgh. So I would go there and visit and, okay. and, and, and go and do a pri private lesson. How old and is he now? He's my age. He's, uh, I think he's 62. I think he was born the same year. As uh, me. And Lou, Lou Shingley? I think he's a little bit, uh, I think he was born around 53. So he's probably he's a bit older. He's a bit older. Yeah, he's a little older. Yeah. So they, they all practice. I think some of them were all uh, Swai Jiao. Yeah. You know. I mean, my teacher, I, he, he also knew Wang Peisheng before they passed away, right, before right, he passed right, away. Right, 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 right. And uh, yeah, he knew him back then. So Wang, Wang Peisheng was well known here. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a. Uh, one, one, one thing uh, Lu Xingli uh, uh, said one time, uh, uh, this one guy was with, he asked him about, like, how, how, you know, what's a master, you know? And he said, mm -hmm. uh, he said well, you have, to, uh, you have to be able to lecture. And sort of have your own point of view, you know. He's mm -hmm. very, uh, almost uh, very uh, scholastic type, right? Yeah. Then he says you have to be able to write a book, your own understanding, right? And you got to be able to take all challenges. Well, that's good. <laughs> so, so you know, so it, it's that it's that uh, it's that two of those things, you know, where you're the scholar and the warrior together, you know. Well, most like people that. today they're able to. Flap their lips, <laughs> write a whole bunch, but not back any of it up, which seems to be more common. So maybe he had a he had a premonition of things right, to come. Right, right. Well, look, you see, Wang Pei Sheng, he wrote that. You know, he worked the. Uh, I, I I remember I bought that book like back in the day, the thirty seven mm. posture form that he right. did, and he published that in like nineteen eighty two, and uh, he did that. He did several books in Chinese, mm -hmm. and um, and he did a lot of videotapes. You know. Uh, or VCDs or yeah. VHSs back then. So uh, and he take challenges. Yeah. So it's sort of and Zhang Yun seems same way and Lu, Lu Shengli seems same way. So that's a, it's, Do you it's, think did Zhang Yun have many people come and give him uh, trouble? I, I think was, I think when he was in here in, in uh, Beijing when he went to um, oh okay when here, he was for here sure. when he was here but yeah, back in the back states, states not so uh, much. Well, I, I thought one one of my uh, uh, friends said. Uh, that lives in Princeton to bring him here. He said when he first started doing seminars there, that the guys from New York, they would come and he would tell them, like, put me in a joint lock, do this. Uh, I mean, he's pretty, I mean, in the seminars, mm -hmm. he was doing some, and they couldn't do it, and, you know. Right. They, I mean, he put it on the line. Like, those guys, I guess they're very much, I mean, you know, their skill levels are so high, they, they don't really have that, you know, well, I'll show you tomorrow. Or, right. Or, or uh, I'm not, I don't feel too good today. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. So he would actually do it. Yeah, my one friend said, yeah, it was, these guys were just, their minds were blown at that time, you know. It's like, oh, my God, this is really is the real thing, you know. Yeah. And, and, and that's one of the things, I think, with the Northern Wu style and Wang Pei Sheng was that, uh, you know, Wang Wozai was, was here. He taught for a period of time. Then Yang Yu Ting. I don't know. He must have taught like seventy years. I mean, okay. he died. He was almost a hundred years old. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, and then Wang Pei Sheng, he started training, started to teach when he was eighteen years old, and I think he was born nineteen eighteen. So that'd be 30, 1936 till the and he passed away at two in two thousand four. So he taught all that. So I think what is sort of good in, in our family, I'm not just trying to say that, uh, is that. Um, you only had about two teachers over the course of a, or three teachers over the course of a hundred years, right? Yeah. They sort of made their own development. It stayed very close. Uh, so I think there was a lot, and they worked on it. So they continued the progression of the system. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Where I think some of the systems, like, they moved around, and I don't know how much those people taught. Like Yang Yuting was supposedly one of the first ones to really standardize the methods of teaching the form. Right. Like that, you know, where I, I don't like a lot of them, they didn't ever really stand up. Well, even today, you got to you sort of, yeah. it's not done that way. Everybody got a little bit of different, which I guess is okay. But you can, even, even within my Bagua family, like uh, I would say that between my teacher and his brothers that are still alive, his martial brothers that are still alive, they probably do the Ding Shi Ba Zhang, the fixed posture, right. eight, eight uh, palms, and the 
Lao Ba Zhang is pretty much the same. No, um, but after that, for example, the linking palms, the Lian Huan Zhang, and after that, everyone has a little bit of a slightly like different way of doing but it. But it's pretty much the same. It's, mean, it's the, the close, same thing. It's close. it's close. But but even, and we're talking about now, never right. mind back then, right, right, you know. Right, so right. And I if, think that's important. I think that's the way is a lot of times the systems could uh, continue to grow. People yeah, can get better. Yeah. When it starts, when everybody starts teaching, people moving around, only learn this long, that long, it just, it deteriorates, you know. Yeah. Like I said, like... Uh, uh, Young Yu Ching taught 60, 70 years, you know what I mean? He's doing the same thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, one Pai Sheng, same thing. So it's, uh, you know, and what that's is, important. What are you, what are you, are you focusing just on Wu style? Just or do you, want to, style. you don't want to learn the rest of Wang Pai Sheng's? No, I learned uh, uh, Master Lu's 16 posture form. Okay. Uh, but no, I, I, I at one time was thinking, ah, I did a Bagua, I learned some Shingi from Master Lu and stuff like that. But I really like the Taiji. You know? Okay. I, guess I just really like it. Uh, so I just want to continue in just learning that and, and uh, do, you know getting better at the push hands and, and right yeah so yeah the Wu style it's just uh, yeah like it's uh, I don't know it, it has that like I said it has that simplicity to it you know yeah uh, and, well that's also what Xing Yi has you know right right in, in right. essence it is pretty simple direct straightforward but you can spend your whole life trying to refine it and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and get it good you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. and, and 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 you'll always have something new to work on right so right, right. That's sort of what I always saw, that like, uh, even when I start doing the JKD a little bit, a after the seminar, after really this, uh, the Inner Santo, what they call the JKD concept mm -hmm. part, after I started doing the JKD with Ted Warren, that was it. I like to stay with one teacher, yeah. learn from that person, and just keep refining the art. You know? Do you still yeah. practice your Jeet Kune Do? Yeah, sometimes I do. Yeah, I still do. I, I think it probably if I got, if I was in the situation, I'd probably do the JKD. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think he's trying to tell me he says that, that I get actually softer from the doing the Taiji. The it changes my JKD a little bit. You know what I mean? Is that for the better or for the worse? Uh, for the better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. Well, it is again. It's that body awareness. You know what I yeah. mean? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, that yeah. ability to. To uh, you know, Xin Yi moves a different way, generates power differently. Yeah, yeah. But you gotta, but but you gotta refine that method, you know. Yeah. Uh, tai Chi does it a little bit different. Boxing does it different. You know. I used to tell people too, I, and one of the training methods I used to do was, I used to get, I got like uh, Tommy Hearns. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I, in fact, I met Tommy Hearns once, but I'm tall like Tommy Hearns. Okay. I'm sort of built like him, and I sort of used to at one time sort of move more like him. Everybody wants to be Muhammad Ali, right? Yeah. So I always tell them, get you know, get a get, find a fighter that you sort of can uh, that you, you sort of emulate a little bit naturally, you know, yeah. don't, somebody, somebody who that, relates to who, you, who relates yeah. to you. Uh, so I always watch the you know Tommy Hearns fights. I always used to watch them and sort of yeah. figure that and how the body moves. So you stand, then you sort of say, oh, because everybody moves different. That's sort of what's what's good about boxing too is that it it is more free. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they don't have a, a Gus Diamato style. Or, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They don't have these styles or methods. You know, they sort of have like a. Well, Gus taught. He like he favored the peekaboo style, and right, he right, found right. somebody that exactly. would be suitable for right. that style. And you know, the peekaboo style was was not respected. Right. 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 It was just like. You weren't doing much. When Cus was was saying that he's going to have a champion of the world who's using peekaboo style, guys were thinking that that's ridiculous and uh, that'll never happen. And and then Tyson came along and he just happened to be the perfect <laughs> body for that method. So, Did you imagine yeah. him doing Shingi? I think he'd be <laughs> devastating. He, and again, he has that awareness. I mean, yeah. when you see some of those uh, uh, some of those videos of him moving, coming right off that with his leg and his yeah. body, man, and just hit it hit so hard. Actually, he's one of the people when I have when people have this dogmatic uh, uh, argument about internal and external, <laughs> and I'm like, all right, so what do you think internal is? And they're like, oh, well, internal is like uh, I, I would give a suggestion, like, okay, do you think it's refined body mechanics? Yes, and I said, so it's not it's not possible with external style. Oh, of course not. It's an <laughs> internal thing. I'm like, so what do you think boxing is? Oh, that's external. And then I put a video of um, of Tyson in his prime moving and right. I'm like, and how about this? Is that not refined body it's mechanics? A, right. I mean, that's highly refined body mechanics. It is. I mean, he's come, when he's, he's there a little low and he just comes up, yeah. you could just see 
it just starts from the foot, the All body the up. goes up to his ass, pushes his body, and it just explodes. Right. Like that fast. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. It takes your head off. And, yeah. And you can see the force. I mean, you can watch the video and you can see the force. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, and that, that's what I think any... I think the, the key point about internal, external tobacco is, uh, is high-level refinement... And I think that's what we're trying to say mm -hmm. is what you should be chasing. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of the requirements that we start with in styles like Xingyi and Bagua and Taiji is already a higher level of right, refinement. Right, right, exactly. But it doesn't mean that other styles don't do the same exactly. thing over time. Right. It's just high level and, and, and low level. And, and to think that somebody that doesn't do a certain style can never reach that that's just wrong no, and no. the the converse of that is also true somebody can do some really terrible shingi mm -hmm. and really terrible bagua and really ter terrible taiji with low level body mechanics it's, it can be done too right, so it's right. not really the style it's the method right. although certain principles are ingrained into the style more right, clearly right right, yeah. right 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 so exactly the way they generate force that's why I usually yeah, look yeah, at it yeah. that way they're a little bit different uh, but the refinement sort of goes. I mean, the, the refinement of the body mechanics has to somehow interact how the force generation is. Yeah, or some yeah, sort yeah. Of, you know. Well, I mean, Xingyi, for example, for for me, that's why the key point we start with Zhang Zhuang, standing post right. Santi Shi. And people think, what's the point of this? And some people will teach it. No, that's to build your inner chi. No, it's to build a structure. Right. Is to build a structure, then connect the structure, feel those connections, be aware of them, and be able to maintain them that they're always there. Right. So you build that structure, and then you start to learn how to move that structure while maintaining those connections. And that's it. That's right. high-level refinement. I mean, okay, that's different to a lot of other systems which don't start with that as a requirement first, and they want to get you just to be mobile first. Right. But, right. but in the end, all of them will refine if they're done correctly, right. will refine and, and become... Yeah, like there that. is a training method. It's right. like in the Wu style... Uh, we do like the seven star stance. Yeah, like that one is the one that, that you really want to focus on. Right. And again, it's developing strength, your alignment, your posture. Yeah. The separation of one leg yin, one leg yang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You Empty. Know, you have full. that awareness and stuff like that. And then you could do the other one where you're doing the just a standing like a tree hugging posture too. Right, right. One when is on one leg and one is on two legs. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just to develop that, and that that will keep refining. And then as you keep practicing the form, and you keep those points and things in line. Then your development, and then you move smooth. You know, you're not using a lot. Well, what it is is just you're able to generate force using the minimum amount of of, of muscles. Yeah, know? yeah, that's it. I mean, and I, I, for me, I've also been thinking about the best way to to say the same thing you've just said right. in a way that people don't become soggy noodles. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because right. I, I, I think that the key that people misunderstand is that word minimal or using minimal force. Right. I think that's where people get lost. It's using the right amount of force, force. to do to get the Not job tiny. done. Yeah, right, right. So no, it's right. the adequate amount of force, force to get the job done right. as best as possible without overusing force, force. that doesn't have a, right. it starts to have diminishing returns right. or underusing force which doesn't even get you to the goal that you're trying to do. So this is where this is where I also think right. that people misunderstand. Or even like as far as developing, like you know, one of the things like kinesthetic perception, you right. know, the idea that when you are extending your arm that the one side is relaxing and the other side is lengthening. Right. And it's, and it's you know, I try to tell people, it's like, it's like, if you don't do that, it's like driving your car with the emergency brake on. You know what I mean? And you don't want that. You right, don't want right, that right, right. No matter what you're doing, you don't want that emergency brake so that it just at least, uh, and then you're able to, to, to generate the force and you don't get tired at the same time. You know? Yeah, yeah. Or screw up your car. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Insurance, I don't know if they cover that. <laughs> But what, what's it like training with, with Lu Shengli? I mean, what is he, is, does he, is he, what, what, what is the process that he usually uses when he teaches? Uh, it's sort of funny. It, it's, it's a combination of, usually what happens is, he teaches me what I am to learn that time. And he usually teaches me something else. It's sort of like off the wall, I, I think at the time. Right? <laughs> okay, you got to do this. Okay, all right. So, because like when I was do some stuff, like when I was practicing the Taiji, he would show me some like tongbei, right? He'd okay. Like a couple tongbei exercises, right? And I said, okay. So I'd be doing that. And then I'd, I'd practice it at home, but I'd sort of leave it a little bit, practice a little bit, because I was mostly doing the taiji. And then 
and then and then one time he was sort of I wanted to do a thing, but he wanted to, I don't know if it was me or I wanted to learn to do some shingi, right? Okay. So he showed me some shingi, and then we do the wu style form again. And then, so later on, then when I got, I think what it was was. Then he wanted me to learn the 16 posture form. Well, in the 16 posture form, you have Tongbei, Shingi. So it's it, all in there. It's all in there, right? So it's like he was, uh, it's so that when he was I getting started, you ready. He was getting me ready for it. So that's what I mean. It, uh, it's just mind blowing on how the guy, how when you train with him, it's just like I, whatever I want to learn by the end of the, when I'm leaving, I've learned it. Yeah. He just knows how to do it. He must figure in his mind. I mean, He's not just teaching me. He got, I mean, he in his mind knows where I should be each day, where yeah. I should get, how good I should get each day, learn this. Uh, it, it, it's just amazing, you know? Yeah. And then he puts those little tiny things in, and then next thing you know, 16 positive. So that you, next time I come, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't know it, but I'm more ready for it. Again, the awareness is there. Because the Tung Bei is totally different than the Tai Chi. Totally, right? yeah. Right, so... Yeah. So he sort of, so it's like that. I'm always impressed. It's just like, and it's, and he's very quiet, very humble. So Zhang Yun, same thing. But it's just like they just they just know how to teach, yeah. which is very very unique. I mean, well, he's very meticulous. It sounds. Oh like. yeah, very yeah. meticulous. So. They talk about him as like, um, well, he he says a little bit, but other uh, other people that were students of him said he's one of the few people that would. Um, you know the practice uh, the technique five hundred times. He would practice it five hundred times. Yeah. You know what I mean. But then he said later on, he said that was good, but he, the principles are more important. You yeah. You know what I mean. So that that, that that's his thing because you can see when he moves, he has a just exactness where it should be. At where it team. should be. Yeah. Some people are like you know in the Tai Chi, it's like. Ah, it doesn't have to be exact. It's sort of like more the feel. Yeah. Well, well, he's exact with the feel. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just like, it's right there. Everything is just very smooth. And, and I think, too, part of his, uh, his training, because he was in security at, uh, what is that called? The Beijing Technical Institute mm -hmm. down near him. And uh, he was uh, head of security there. So okay. a lot of his stuff, too. So I, I think some of that stuff, because he is very application-oriented. Okay. See, well, the book he wrote, right? Shingi Bagua. Right, right. Combat, Combat techniques of yeah. that. And, that, and that's the, what he uses a lot. Like Pam Mujan, you know, he yeah. likes that. He likes uh, some of the other stuff uh, in, in the Shingi. Like, I think I told you the uh, five elements, but the, but, the, uh, but the animals he likes is the tiger, the monkey, and a horse. Yeah, horse is one of my preferred go-to <laughs> smack you in the face techniques. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone's slightly different. Monkey is not, not for me. But right, I mean, right, right. like I say, Sun Lutang was uh, his favorite was, was monkey. monkey. Right, right, so, right. Yeah, yeah. So there, I see that he sort of pulls that, is sort of the application values that he sees in it. Uh, <clears throat> of that. Um, yeah, he does that a lot. Like, like Pam Mujan, oh, yeah, that, that's like he uses that a lot. Pam Mujan is eight mother palms. No, no, uh, where he, uh, Pam the face. Oh, okay. I put my, my Chinese horrible. But no, he gets there. Pai Mian. Pai Mian, right? Pai Mian means to slap the face. Slap the, so he gets there, boom, and he, and he just like, boom. And, and then once he hits you, if you resist, okay, if you resist, then all of a sudden you're going, you're going even harder back. It's okay, he'll go, he'll go one, two, boom. So if you go that way, because he has that hand behind your back, you right? Sort of feeling. Ah, it's just it's so unique, you know. Yeah. And, uh, Have you done any weapons with him? Uh, I learned a broadsword, yeah, and it's Wu style broadsword. Wu style broadsword, yeah. It's very and and what they do is they teach the broadsword before they teach the straight sword. I wonder why. Because they say he says uh, uh, when I asked Zhang Yun one time, like, what's the pr sort of progression? Yeah. He said the uh, the broadsword is important because it uh, the the straight sword. He says it's too much like Tai Chi. It moves too much like it. With a broadsword, you have that strength. You have that power. And uh, and I noticed it helped my uh, the broadsword form because, you know, you're up one leg, you come down, and you have sort of more of that, that turning. It does help your Tai Chi because you're not, you know, real slow. It's a little oh, bit more. Oh, it's a little bit more dynamic. It's more dynamic, yeah. Okay. So it helps you that way to get, you know. Again, I think, I, I think it is really that uh, Yang Yuting, Wang Pei Shang, that they not only practiced it, but they taught, and they wanted to be able to trans uh, transmit the information to other people okay. to keep the art alive. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. So um, I think they really looked at the training methods. 
of how you can get people better. Now, I know the same thing with Ted Wong, too. Same thing. He was able to get uh, what he would teach you. And that's why people like him so much, was you were able to get it and understand it because he just knew the ref how you refine it, where you should be. Uh, again, he was a, a chemical engineer. So he had a, he had a, he had a thought Program process. Program as an engineer. Yeah, engineer. <laughs> So they get it. They look at it probably totally different, you know. Yeah, yeah. Did the um, what is the curriculum of Wu style? I mean, as far as Wang Pei Sheng's curriculum. Well, you learn that you know, thirty-seven posture form. Hand. Okay, so that's barehanded. Barehanded. Then you do the push hands. Okay. That was a, 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 but push hands. Is it? Is there something set to it? Or yeah, they have a couple. They have like. Uh, they have a single push hands on a, on, a, hand. on, a, on a horizontal plane. Okay. They got one on the vertical plane. Okay. Okay. Then you do the forehand. Okay. Okay. Peng Ji. And it was really... Uh, so well, Peng Lu Ji An. Right. But, but you can really see... And that's uh, set. The whole sequence is set. set. Right. And you move... Yeah, it's set. Then they have another one, Dao Lu. But, and it's sort of a two-man. It moves. And then when I asked... Uh, I don't see anybody practice that. And I asked that girl one time. I said... I said I don't I've see seen that in Chen style. Uh -huh. Dao Lu. Yeah, this one's a little different. It's a two-man one, and uh, and it's no. I mean, literally a two-man Dalu two, Toi Shou oh, exercise. Okay, oh, okay. It's a set exercise in in Chen style. Right. I've seen that before. Right. I don't know if it's the same, but I don't know. It's probably uh, probably not. But uh, but then they have uh, that, and then see a lot of other uh, uh, Tai Chi people. They don't practice Dalu. Yeah, I asked yeah, him, yeah. What, yeah. What, 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 what? He said, I don't know. It's just it was one of the. This is an old exercise that people always did. And somehow you know what's interesting about that um, so my brother-in-law and um, he's he's from Inner Mongolia and mm -hmm. he, he practiced a style called uh, Shanxi Rin style seven star mantis which is popular there and mm -hmm. it comes from Shanxi originally mm -hmm. but it's moved uh, it moved to Inner Mongolia because a lot of Shanxi people moved there and mm -hmm. currently the grandmaster the head of the, the style is still there and they have a lot of these it's this is a style of mantis that is considered an internal or soft mantis mm -hmm. um, because it's got influence from uh, Xingyi, Bagua, and Taiji inside mm -hmm. it. And I remember watching, because I've been to Inner Mongolia, I've trained with a grandmaster like maybe 20 odd years ago, maybe even more. And uh, they've got an exercise which is actually identical, almost identical to Chen style Dalu. Mm. So as you said, it was something that a lot of people used to do before even in another unrelated well <laughs> somewhat related but right, unrelated right, right, system right, 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 right. they were doing a similar thing and that's a two man set kind of a right, exercise right, right, you know? right, right. So, I'm doing Pong you're doing Lu exactly. it goes back to back yeah. I try to shoulder you get out of the way right right it's nice yeah it's very nice I was like I was like going, oh, and then, same thing too I think with the forehand um, in the Wu style you know we do Pong G I mean I see G we do G you know, press, yeah. The press the squeeze. Yeah. You know? Most of the people go pong, and then they go G Lu, like like it's yeah, not even there. Right. They just yeah, yeah. just brush right through it. Right. And I'm like, well, I think it's called forehand, not three and a half, or <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, so I, I look at some of those things like that too, because they they are even the push hands gets more performance based. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. People walking around stuff like that, but but it is just a, you know single fixed, you know a horizontal vertical. vertical the forehand and the other one and then they got a couple other ones I haven't learned yet as far as they have doing it but yeah so these are these are set classical push hands exercises these are from these are from you know because the, the, the lineages uh, Wang Lu, uh, Yang Yu Chan to Guan Yu yeah Guan Yu to Wang Mozai Wang Mozai to Yang Yu Ting to Wang Pei Sheng okay okay so there's not many there's not too many people in between. Right, you know, right, form. right. And and a lot of those people are, and again, you cut down the amount of generations and you're still having those people teach and they're coming into the 20th century. It's not... You're it's not missing them. You're not missing them and they kept that information. Because that was one of the things that, um, for me, one of the key things when I look at modern Tai Chi and especially the Yang derivatives, mm -hmm. And when I look at classical Chen style, the, the Chen style curriculum has so it's so rich, right? Right. And it's rich in terms of um, things like you just said, 
like those those partner toy show things weaponry where certain young style stylists lost some weaponry other other derivatives mm-hmm. like sun style they lost a whole lot of other things mm-hmm. too they, they they focused on certain things mm-hmm. but that was all there before it was quite a rich curriculum and and you and it seems like your your wu line has still maintained right, a lot right, of it right. they get the uh, you know the, uh, straight sword broadsword. they do a staff form but the staff form is it's, they call it like a sticky staff is to develop your stickiness for your spear. It's not really a staff form. It's like a, it's like a forehand with the staff. Okay, so Pung Ji Lu and on with the yeah. staff. That's a develop. So when you have your spear form, right. So that's that's the curriculum. So it's form. actually a spear based uh, yeah, training. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I think I, I mean I have seen it. I've seen the the sticky the sticky. sticky right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the system there. Yeah. Just practice the hell out. Of it. What else? I mean, what in terms of weapons? What are there? That's it. Straight, Straight sword, sword, broad, broad sword. sword uh, the staff for that, and then the spear. So then in the broad sword, some of some of uh, uh, Master Lee told me some some of the people practice they uh, throw darts. There's a p- couple parts where you turn, you can throw a dart. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's included in there. Yeah, included in there. So yeah. that's that's like some of the guys practice that. He said, "Yeah, that's that's hidden there. weapons." Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and and okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Does he know it? Yeah, he knows how. Yeah, yeah. He said, "There's parts of it. See, this, uh, it's a it's a classic thirteen posture Taiji uh, sword form, broad sword form. with dart throwing in there. But then there's parts where you turn and you're able, yeah, and you throw the darts. I don't know if they were added in later on, part of it, right? But yeah, but some of the people they they, they do that in the in the broad. That's sword interesting. Form. That's very interesting. Uh, it, it's it's pretty cool though too. Though, like the Taiji sword we use, we use the the, the you know the long that almost look like a samurai." With the with the with the um, the S guard, the S guard in okay. it with the hook on the bottom. Yeah, it has a diff- definite different feel okay. than that regular just chopping type of broadsword, right. you know. And then you know you got the bottom sharp, and then you got the little bit of the top sharp. Yeah, yeah, it's got there. a false edge. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's pretty unique. You can feel, I can feel it too when you practice with a good sword. I mean, you can really feel. Well, you know, I think a lot of people have uh, gotten used to the oxtail shape of a sword. Right, right, right. Um, which is the common produced, mass produced type of a. Uh, style of a broadsword, but they don't actually realize that, especially in the Qing dynasty. That wasn't dynasty, used in the battlefield. Yeah, but also in the Qing dynasty, the more common sword wasn't that right. shape. Right. So right. it was a thinner shape. Right. Like and the I've one shown we use right is yeah. more the battlefield one, the one that looked like a samurai sword. Well, such. exactly. I mean, right. the samurai sword. I mean, that's that's how we see it. But right, it's right, just right. a thinner. It's a thinner curved shape. edged. Right, right. And I've got I've got a, a my 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 personal broadsword is one of those uh, Qing Dynasty long uh, ones, like a thinner. You know, like yeah, what you just right, you just right. described. And when I show people this sword, they're like, "But isn't this Japanese?" I'm like, "No, it's, it's a Chinese sword." It's <laughs> a Chinese sword, right? Yeah. Right, right. So this a lot of people. Samurai sword came from. Well, yeah, I mean, the, cha- the samurai sword came from a Tang Dynasty same sword. Thing. I wouldn't say it's exactly, exactly. the same exactly. thing, right. and I also wouldn't discredit the Japanese because they truly I'm developing. They it. developed that right. sword, and they really they took it to to places right. that is really really right. refined for their needs. Right. But to think that only the Japanese would have a thinner <laughs> blade, or that's the, that's ridiculous. Right. You know, I mean. That that was all over all over here all too, over yeah. So, all over the world. Yeah, well, I mean, different shape, <laughs> right, different. a curved edge, or a straight double edge. I mean, this is what we should right, try right. to uh, focus on when we're differentiating between jian and right. dao. Don't worry about what the hand guard no, shape looked right. like. Don't worry about how thick the blade was. How the long? use is 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 based on single edge curved, right. double right. edge straight. Right. And then you're gonna change the way you use it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, have you done the spear at all with him? I just learned some uh, spear exercises. Okay. That he did. Well, that's uh, the beginning part that's of the it. Beginning, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Again, see, he teach me just the exercise, so that one day when I'm ready, I want. What is this? The Wu spear spear work like? Uh, what type of a spear do they use? Do they use a, a long? Partic- they use a long. They a particularly long one, right. similar to what we use in Xingyi, that long or yeah, yeah, yeah. that close? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they use a long one. Uh, they said one place uh, was, was very good at spear. But, one of his, yeah. uh, one of his, uh, I think he, uh, his like kung fu um, brother was uh, his, his, his teacher was uh, Li Xuan. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, 
So and they so they exchange like techniques. Spear, I mean, spear, spear, spear. Right, right. Yeah. But the Wu spear is, uh, you know, that's part of the Wu family. I think a lot. Of, I, I don't know uh, completely, but I think a lot of the stuff that maybe from Li Xuan is the training method of doing it. I mean, okay. he probably was really. I mean, he was supposed to be the, the sword guy, or the was, spear guy, right? Yeah. Uh, Zhang Yun told me a, a funny story, a pretty funny story. Uh, there was a guy that, that was very famous and he had a technique that Li Xuan wanted and he couldn't and the guy wouldn't teach it to him. So he gets a big cart and he direct uh, and he decorates it all up, right? And he brings it into the town where the spear master is. And it said, number one spear guy, right? So this guy comes on and he's all pissed off because like I'm the number one spear guy. So he goes and he sort of like has sort of like a challenge with Li Xuan and he does it and then Li Xuan sees the technique. He goes, no, that cart was you. You were the number one spear guy, not me. Sure. But it's the idea he tricked him, you know. To, so he, to, he, he called him out and then the guy used the technique, technique and he learned right, it. Right, right, right. right. Oh, interesting. interesting. But, but what he did was he, yeah, he said, oh no, that cart, uh, that's about you, not about me. <laughs> So he said, oh, so he so Li Xuan said no. The card, the, he means that what he wrote on the card was talking about the other guy. Yeah, about the other guy. <laughs> the other guy lost his mind, and then that way he tricked him to learn the techniques. Okay, interesting. So that's pretty funny, right? So. Well, I mean that's interesting because if you look like uh, at Chen style, they they use big sticks too to develop certain body mechanics and power generation and things like the Dakanza. But usually their spear form is a shorter spear. Oh, really? Right. And they and they 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 have a a method of using changping, which means long weapon, mm-hmm. da or short fighting with a long weapon. Mm. So it's a shorter method of utilizing the long weapon. So I'm quite interested if you say that Wu style, well, your Wu style mm-hmm. is using a, a pretty long, long spear. Right, right, right. Where that actually came from? Yeah, it's on YouTube. You'll see one person doing the doing the, doing the a spear, yeah. And you'll like it. He grabs the very end of it. You know, uh huh. He's got the the end of the spear <laughs> in his hand. The spear in his hand. Yeah, that drives me crazy when I see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They say his. Uh, uh, I, I've read something again. I'm not a, a spear aficionado yet, uh, but you know, a lot of people said that his is very practical. Yeah. Doing a, yeah. I guess most spears practical anyhow, unless you're doing with a short wusu spear, right? Well, yeah, well, that's what I mean. That's the difference between right. a, a da qiang and a hua qiang. Hua is the short one, which is most commonly used, especially in sport wushu. Right. And hua literally means flower. Mm, right. So. So you can understand that it's mostly based on performance as right, opposed right, to right, right, right. to the older methods. But yeah, yeah, about the spear end protruding from the the grip. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean Wu Shu, the guy, the man Wu Shu, who wrote that Ming Dynasty spear manual. He was quoted as saying, uh, "Liu Ba Shi Wai Hang." That means uh, anybody who has a spear protruding from their hand is an amateur. <laughs> so that that was, uh, there you go. and I mean, my teacher is very adamant about oh, that spear right, end. Right, right. Uh, you keep it within the grip of your hand, mm-hmm. you know. Otherwise, what's it sticking out for at the back? Okay, there's certain times when you right, when up. you move up the shaft to do a, sh- a specific technique. But if you're holding it like that all the time and doing thrusts and whatever, and that's what it's for, so you can just exactly. That well, I mean, it's it's worse than that. When you actually make contact with something, when you thrust into something, there's force pushing back. Right. And if the the end of the spear isn't within your grip, it's just gonna your hand's just gonna slide, slide up the shaft. Right. So, I mean, um, that that's basically our our. Uh, key point about it but there's more to it than that but uh. I, i'm looking forward to the, for the spear because again it develops a certain you know body mechanics yes to it, you know yes I mean? yes i mean definitely for the internal it really does yeah i mean for shingi it's an integral for me it was a key when when i started doing i mean i did shingi for a couple of years with my teacher before he started teaching me spear basics and uh and when he started teaching me spear basics it was like something went click it, it was just amazing. It was like epiphanies on all of the force vectors and body mechanics that I was doing with my bare hands just suddenly just improved, made sense, and I understood where they came from very clearly, you know? And it's, it's really important that that, that, there's, that step is made. Mm-hmm. I actually, I mean, I, I find it odd when I hear about Xingyi people that tell me they've never, ever learned to spear. And I'm like, How? You know, I mean, it's basically a bare hand version of spear practice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. At some point, you should understand the spear and use the spear to develop your your shingi. Okay, given some people might not have access to it, but it is 
it is for me something that I feel is uh, oh, it's missing. Oh, is that pole shaking, those exercises? Well, pole shaking in terms of using your body and connecting right. your, your core and your legs right. to be able to issue force, that's one thing. But when you learn P with a spear uh -huh. and Zuan Chiang uh, drilling with a spear and Bung with a spear and then Pao and Hung, you're like suddenly all the five elements make sense right. and the body mechanics make sense and it just it all just comes together re really well i mean given if you've got a good teacher if you don't right, then right, it still right, doesn't right, make right, sense right, right. but uh yeah that's one of the most difficult it's you know the king of the weapons you know it's it's i mean you know there's one for me those those, those old analogies of the different types of weapons you know like the the spear is the king, king, king you yeah. know the, the the broadsword is like a fierce tiger right, right. you know the the spear is a phoenix i mean sorry the, the straight sword is a flying phoenix and and the the, the staff is like a rain I'm, I'm like falling rain okay i get it but you know there's one reason why spear was considered the king of all weapons because you can kill people. Well, <laughs> it's a thrusting weapon right. with a, a sharp pointy right. bit at the end. Straight thrusts are pretty hard to right. Right. to uh, you know defend, deflect, to see coming. And it, because it's got longer length. Right. I mean, right. Right. I, that doesn't mean that a guy... This is, this is the other interesting analogy. A guy who's really good with a, with a broadsword against a guy who's not very good with a, with a spear... The spear might try, might try, uh, well, might or will level the playing field a little bit and give the broadsword guy a bit of an, an advantage. But if you've got two guys that are really skilled with their weapons and the one guy's got a, a long weapon, the other guy's got a short weapon, the long weapon will right. always have the advantage. Well, that's so. what our broadsword form, our broadsword form is against the spear. Okay. That's what it's Very for, interesting. Because right? the idea is that a guy who has a spear is going to usually win. Yeah. So the way in which you got to do the broadsword, you got to be evasive with it. you got to make sure that you're, you know, you're a distance from it, take advantage of certain things to it because the idea that, you know. Yeah. And that, yeah. that to I was told that that is the classical method of how you learn. To, it's supposed to be, because that's the hardest yeah. So if somebody didn't have a spear, right, and you had a broadsword, it'd be a lot easier, right? Yeah, like that's yeah. sort of like the hardest, right? So that's what our form is. That's what the broadsword. Form it's quite is. interesting. I've been I've been doing. I mean, over years, I've been doing a lot of research of other countries' martial arts, and one of the interesting things for me is the old or Koryu Japanese systems, the old Japanese ryuha, the, their Japanese uh, very classical systems, and they have a lot of partner work, a lot of partner. Mm. Work. A lot of their kata is actually set partner kata, mm -hmm. all right? And most of the systems focus on the sword. Mm -hmm. But you'll see that they'll be using other weapons. In, it's included in their, in their training. For example, the naginata, which is like a, right. a halberd, kind of close kind of to... Like a spear, yeah. Well, it's kind of like a, a tadao or a... a, a or, yeah, kind of, a, but a thinner version right. with a thinner head. But the key of learning it is not to learn how to use the, the naginata or learning... It's learning how to use a sword against the naginata or learning a sword against another weapon. And that's really interesting. I mean, it's kind of like in what you've just mm -hmm. said, that uh, the broadsword is learned to... or trained to learn how to use against... Uh, or right. fight against a spear. But yeah, it's quite, it's quite interesting. So I think China... I mean... The spear is uh, one of the key battlefield weapons, and mm -hmm. in Japan, maybe the the focus on a lot of these older systems was the, the, the katana, yeah, or the, the because people were just walking around with them. Samurais right, right, were walking right, right. around with them. The samurais were, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and it had sort of like a spiritual, religious thing too. With well, yeah, I mean that that would be, that would come naturally heavy. from it. Yeah, I have two students actually uh, that uh, do the sword, and they go back and forth to Japan. Okay. And they also uh, do testing uh, in the U.S. two, three times a cutting. You know, they do the oh, cutting. test cutting. The, the tatami, yeah. And they yeah. have beautiful, beautiful swords. It's different. They say that the Tai Chi sort of helps them. And it the focus and it all would. that other stuff. Yeah. The relaxation. It would, yeah. Have you ever tried to do test cutting? No, no, not yet. I said, you know, he, he, one day, uh, one of them said, oh, you should... I says I don't need another hobby again. Oh, okay. I remember we actually spoke about this. <laughs> yeah, I said I don't yeah, want another yeah. hobby again. Otherwise, I'd be buying, you know, going out and buying, you know, 
few thousand dollar katanas and say, but, oh, well, yeah. but you could cut with a Chinese sword. Yeah, you know, I, I have uh, two, actually, both of my, uh, two of my swords, my, uh, no, three swords I have. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're all sharp tempered and everything else. They're real swords. They're real swords, right. I just, I don't know, just, I, don't know, I, I might one of these days try it, you know, so. What, what, are, what are they, straight swords? Uh, one straight sword and two of them are broad swords. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I do, occasionally I do, I'll do when I, when I have enough stuff to cut, I'll, I'll do test cutting with my Chinese swords. Right, it's right. actually very good. They do it every week. I mean, I don't. I don't mean you should go use a katana, but right, maybe right, go right. with them because they've got stuff to cut. Right, right, right. And, yeah, yeah. And, they go and, down. That's in fact what I do on Sunday. Sometimes I drive down to the one guy. He's a school. He has a school, and they go there. And you know, they they import the uh, tatami. Yeah, that was uh, rolled up. They rolled to up, up the old stuff that comes out of the house. Right, that's what it right, is. They right. They get it. They say, they ship it over. They get a container. And then they uh, start getting them, they soak them, and they practice because uh, they have two, there's two schools that they sort of follow okay. as far as the cutting and so on like that is. You know, it's very interesting though. I mean, it's, it's very simple, you know what I mean? They have certain cuts. They got like certain patterns, like sort of katas, you know, right, they right. have the cuts. And uh, then they have sort of like, uh, uh, you know, you cut, uh, you know, you cut one tatami a certain with a certain pattern, right? And then you cut two two of them, or on the other cut you cut, and then before it falls you cut it again, right? You know, stuff like that. It is pretty cool, you know. They do have it. It's not easy. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's not, not easy, easy to do a and good they got, cut. And you know, they got a little uh, measurement, you know, forty five degree angle has right. to be this way. It's not easy. No, yeah. it's, you know, no, it's not easy for somebody to do it like that. You know? But you know what I found when I started cutting was it helped me understand body mechanics in terms of the techniques a little bit better too and also where force is applied force yeah, yeah. that would be yeah I, I probably should do it with a sword yeah because you can see how you how much how much you really need to generate yeah and yeah how yeah. much after you generate the force are you gonna fall out you know what i mean yeah or how tense do you, do you cut through it yeah, even how you grip the handle makes right. a difference so it's a good thing um i don't know not not everybody has the opportunity to do it but if you do i suggest right, it right. and you don't have to use tatamis you can use rolled up newspaper. Just oh, really? It. Yeah, you can use rolled up newspapers. Uh, you can uh, you can find things that are replicable to cut, so that are relatively inexpensive. I uh, just be, have, the, the the key here is, I mean, to anybody who's listening, is safety first. Right. right. Don't cut your own leg off. Right, right. Don't uh, don't uh, <laughs> because that's the key thing here. The the, the overswing, or, right, you know. Right. Uh, the the the, cut, the follow through is usually when people cut themselves. Right. So be sure you know what you're doing and right. and be careful first. Yeah, everybody on his dojo, they all stand that way while they're cutting that. Yeah, and the safety, safety of the people around, around you and where you're doing right, it, right, uh, right, you know. Right. So the sword slip out of your hand. But no, I, I did see uh, they have a teacher. He's a, he's a Westerner, and uh, he taught them a lot. And then he made the connection between two sword masters from Japan to come mm -hmm. over. And uh, I witnessed him cutting, like, uh, he had uh, three tatamis on there. And it was just like, again, we go back to the body awareness. Yeah. He cut, like, boom, 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 like, within seconds. He cut three of those tatamis, uh, which aren't easy. And yeah. then he's, like, cutting as one's going. He's cutting again. It was, like, unbelievable. But you could see how he was just moving, and it was like nothing. You know? Yeah. You know? Perfection. Yeah. It really is, and, that, and that's what a lot of the, the martial arts really is supposed to be about, you know, the development uh, of the individual. You know? Yeah. That, that's yeah. what I always thought it was. I'm not really big into teaching as much as I am. You don't teach? I very seldom teach, you know. Okay. You know, uh, I have some students that do the Tai Chi, but I use them for bodies to develop my own. Yeah, but it's good. Training right, partners. Right, 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 yeah. Training partners. And then even the JKD, I always just had small groups. And one time I asked Ted Wong one time, I said, when, you know, when I first moved down to Florida, I said, what do you think? You think I should open a school or this or teach? He always liked going to my boxing gym in Pittsburgh because it was like, you know, it was like in a barn, right? And it was, a, <laughs> it was in a barn and the split wood was there and it was real hard and it had arc. He was always good to work. But he said that uh, he believed that, uh, and, Jay and Bruce Lee believed that it's meant to be taught with a small group in the backyard. So, so informal. Informal. In, but very but uh, still, personal. Yeah, personal. Yeah. Okay. And the development of the individual. You know, of, uh, you know, and, and I mean, that's the one thing I've also been thinking about the value of traditional martial arts. And one of the big value of, well, not just traditional, but all martial arts is the social unit that is developed mm -hmm, mm -hmm, within mm -hmm. a group. Right. It's right, really right. important. It's like a place of, 
it's finding a place you belong you know in a group of people that that and that's really important i think that's also part of uh and that helps to learn right you know? right oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you give in the right environment well you read that book or the type one book what is it called some art of killing kill. art of killing i mean uh, pat burleson he talks about you know, during the beginning of the of the uh, Taekwondo in the United States, it was just a kick ass. You know, yeah, to spar. Somebody's coming in the door. Uh, can he spar better? Can we make him a national champ? This, uh, he said the self development part, which they said they should have been working on. Yeah, they didn't. Now it's a little bit more, but then it's gone the other way as well too. Yeah, as far as the the, the fighting part of it is too. So it is finding that bal- balance between development and and, and martial. You know. Well, what do you think led Taekwondo down its uh, route that's become a bit estranged from... Well, I guess it's... Uh, well, I guess those guys are sort of passed... The hardcore guys passed away. And, yeah. Well, they became very successful. The, you know, all the people that were going through the kooky one and yeah, all that yeah, stuff, yeah. that became very successful. Uh, people saw that uh, putting a martial art into the Olympics, yeah. that was something, you know... Uh, so people started going that way. They had a good marketing. I mean, you read that book. You see how everybody yeah. everybody's paying to do this. So it ended up in, uh, you know, it took off. I mean, it's still probably, I don't read, I don't read too much anymore about it. But uh, I guess it's still one of the most popular arts in the world. Well, if it's, uh, it is. I mean, right, right, that's right. the one thing here in China. Uh, he, even in my neighborhood, I train downstairs, outside. And sometimes uh, you'll see people just walk by and sometimes somebody will stop and watch me and it'll be a mother or a father with a child and the child will be wearing a dobok or a, a right, taekwondo right, 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 right. out gi, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Uh, because he's just gone to the taekwondo school up the road and there's more kids doing taekwondo in China today than there are doing Chinese martial arts. And I mean, of course it is because of the popularity that is right, done through right, the exposure right. of the Olympics it's and the right, prestige right. of of the Olympic Games and, and I mean that's it's nice to see that they've done that for themselves I don't know I mean internally what they've lost right, or how right, things have changed right. because you know from my perspective a lot of things have changed and they've oh, lost yeah, definitely. They've, they've cut off a lot to be to fit that model but for me as a Chinese martial artist I find it quite strange that I'm a westerner basically a Caucasian practicing a Chinese martial arts while Chinese kids are staring at me in <laughs> Korean outfits right, you know, and they're yeah, not yeah, doing yeah, Chinese yeah. martial arts so. well I remember doing ta- uh, Taekwondo uh, in the 70s they already it already started to go in that direction you know yeah what I mean? it already started to go more sporty oriented and they did always have a lot of uh, closed tournaments you know one of the things too was the Koreans were very big on that you didn't go to open tournaments we did you know we did yeah. the, we did the, we did the Taekwondo closed tournaments and we did the open uh, karate tournaments. Okay. We, we just wanted to spar. I mean, right. We wanted to spar. We wanted to do uh, uh, kung fu forms. We wanted to do. We just wanted to do everything and yeah, anything okay. that was related to martial arts. We didn't care, and, and, and that was the one thing that was that was pretty cool back then. Then, the, then it sort of got like all of a sudden it started to go. Everybody started to separate again, and this is better than that. Man. Yeah. But I remember in the seventies and eighties, people were just like, "Oh, what do you know? I know this. Oh, show me those kicks." Show me those Taekwondo kicks. Huh? I'll show you this. It was like more, I don't know if you'd have that now or not. But you were saying the Koreans were not open to going to open tournaments? No. It was mostly closed tournaments. So only within no, only one. Korean tournaments. They are pretty good, though, because what they did was they were, you know, they had their own little group, right? And they had these masters come. So the demonstrations were fantastic, you know, but it was all small and... But but it did have something to it too because a lot of times when you got to be a black belt right yeah and after that tournament all the masters said then you got to eat something eat with the masters but that's what I'm talking about the social thing right that was very cool back then that's the social thing and I mean we get it still here somewhat in the traditional communities like the Chinese traditional communities when we have a get together with my Bagua family for example Mm -hmm. and then after like for example tomb sweeping. Right, 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 right. We'll go, we'll all meet at the tomb of Li Zeming and Dong Hai Chuan. They'll do the whole thing. And then we'll go to a restaurant and everyone will get completely shit-faced. <laughs> but completely shit-faced. And rec- it, it, it's, it used to be something that I found strange. Like just how it was the same formula every year. But over the years, I've come to appreciate it a lot. Because you've got the old timers. Right, right, right. And they're getting shit-faced. Right. And they're repeating the same story <laughs> that I've heard every single year about the past, about some incident or some issue. And they're repeating it. And everyone is pretending like it's the first time they've heard it. And it's somewhat endearing, you know? I mean... Oh, yeah. I remember them, too. They would get a beer. Like, they get... Yeah, because you, you wouldn't see them this way. they come in, 
teach. They have perfectly starched uniform yeah. technique right there. Then all of a sudden, you're at one of these. They're opening the can of beer. They're drinking it like this, and then they out go, of the can, boom, like this, and then and smashing it, it. knife hand, and throw it down. <laughs> they wouldn't even like sip it. You know, just drink it, pull the tab, drink it, boom. boom. Yeah, I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's part of the culture, and that's what people people need to understand, and it's part of the. St- you know, I mean, we've got this word. I, I, I mean, I've spoken about it before. It's like shivu. It's got the word right. father in there. Right, 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 right. It's denoting a relationship. It's not denoting a rank. No. And these relationships are built within this martial right. family on things like this, not necessarily just training. Right, 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 right. And if you don't have this relationship, then the training lacks too. Right. You know, it's it's really important. Right. You've got a pretty close relationship to your teacher. You right. go, you actually you live what, with all him. My, all my, all my, te- oh, I've only had four teachers in the past. Uh, I've been training for, since 73, which is 46 years. I've yeah. only had four teachers. I stay with a teacher, and then you, you become, you know, they become your Sifu, you know, yeah. they're like your, uh, your, uh, your father. You right, know? right. Yeah, and that's the same thing. People go, ah, I'm Sifu so-and-so. It's like, no, you're no, not. no, you're not. You don't give yourself that. That's like, I'm, I'm Father Bill. Yeah, you know right. I mean? You don't do that. You know, your, your students call you Sifu, and that's just a sort that's of That's a thing. different thing. It's a different thing. Not right? publicly. That's publicly, not a right. It's not something that you, you know, you got on your certificate or anything like that. So Yeah, it's important. And I think it's also misunderstood in them because people think that the word Shifu means master. Right, right, right. No, it means your, your teacher, teacher slash father. Right, right. That's what it literally means. And it means nothing to anybody else. That relationship exists between you and your teacher, and that's it. Well, a lot of things. When I first started training in the seventies, they were all men. I was like the youngest. I was I was fifteen years old. I was like the youngest one there. Yeah. And there was one woman. I remember that was it. There were no kids. There were no. And a lot of the guys that I trained with, because I come from a pretty tough neighborhood, they didn't even need martial arts to fight. You know what I mean? Yeah. These were big, strong guys. I don't even know why they. Well, they liked my teacher. They were all usually friends with my one teacher there. But it was just like a different. Then you could see during the eighties, it just started to shift. Then, then more and more kids. And then you know. So now. A lot of these places are just like uh, they teach 45 minutes. They pick them up in a van from school. They have them do some stuff. I guess that's a good thing. I can't. I can't say it's all bad, but sometimes certain things are still lost. It becomes more like a babysitting service. Than, but that's what. That's the thing, though. And I, I've got a lot of. I mean, I'm in the industry. I was in the industry in terms of the formal martial arts uh, federation industry so I, I mean i meet a lot of people and a lot of them like in the states especially they were telling right. me that that's the only way they can survive that's the only way they, they don't survive off the the amount of adults they barely have that many adults right. they right. have to do these after school after like these kids class so that's the bulk that that pays the rent right and keeps the water and the lights on and uh, whatever they get extra where they really want to focus on passing on whatever art they're passing right. to the adults right. or right. to the more serious people that's a minority and if right. they had to focus on that right. they wouldn't make it it's well, a you know, sad reality right like i tell people like in the 70s i mean we, we had a few um health clubs very few most of it was in the ymca right yeah uh tennis that was only in certain areas mostly wealthy areas you couldn't just go to a tennis club or this or that right yeah and uh, it's just more competition now of people's leisure time. They could do so much more yeah. back then, and it's sort of uh, it's sort of changed now. And so, uh, you know, when I talk to people, and even when I was uh, in the '70s and '80s, when I was running a school, you need—I don't know if it's the same now—you need a minimum of a hundred students just to keep the doors open. Because, you know, over the course of time, I, I remember every once in a while, you know, we, I, I go, I look to see if there's a place to rent, right? Rent has gone up so high now. Yeah, right? that's you the know, issue. Rent, all your overhead costs are so high. you got to have insurance. you got to have... That's insurance. it. It's rent, insurance, rent, and those insurance, things. insurance, and you want to eat. You know, you don't yeah. want to break even. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so, so, you know, you need 100 students at least. And then they're starting now, people start to test like, and it's everywhere. It's not just the Taekwondo people. You know, uh, tw- you know, uh, every two months. Yeah, some you know, belt grading. This, 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 yeah. this. Yeah, and you're getting them from the school, and they're doing this, and you know, it's all that. But I, yeah, it's good in a certain sense. I mean, it does. If it's taught, it's still, I know a few people that teach uh, Taekwondo pretty, pretty still very structured. The kids love it, the, and a lot of them. He's had. I think he, he's a little bit younger than me. 
but he's been teaching for a long time in a school environment, and he has students that are probably are probably in their fifties. I mean, okay. he's had them that long. I mean, that long. he has a good. For, yeah, there's yeah. there's some of those out, out there that he's still had. They're still coming back and training and stuff like that. But he's probably taught I don't know how many thousands to get there too. Okay, that's good. You know? But no, he does very well. He, he's a his name is Phil Amaris. And he was a student of Hio Cho. You know him. And uh, so actually, I think he just tested for his ninth dawn. But yeah, he's he, he has excellent ki- children's program still. So there's still those people out there that are that have been teaching it for a long time. That still. You know, what what about in your neighborhood, in Florida? In Florida is like a different. That's like a whole different world down here. I've right? never. I, I've Googled Florida man. I've never. <laughs> I've never Googled Florida man plus kung fu. I, I'd like to see what that turns out. Mo, most of the, in, in Florida, you have a lot of. Uh, well, you got a lot of Brazilian jiu jitsu. Well, that's everywhere Brazil- now. You got a lot of Brazilians uh, there too. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Just, just you know, South American, you know. Right. So Miami has a, a Miami, Fort Lauderdale. There's big Brazilian populations. Okay. There. So you got that. Uh, and that's popular. That's and that's thriving. popular. That's popular. That's popular from a combination of it being popular and there's a lot of Brazilians. Okay. So, uh, yeah, they got top team there. They got some pretty good right. people there. Uh, Chinese martial arts, not too much. A lot of Tai Chi that's uh, Paul Lamb stuff, you know. The, okay, yeah, yeah. He's from Australia. He's from Australia, but he put that uh, program together with right. uh, Tai Chi for diabetes. Right, tai right. For this, tai Chi for that. Uh, you have that. You still got some old karate schools, taekwondo schools. But Chinese martial arts. Chinese martial arts, not too much. Uh, I can't so really I mean, you 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 do have a somewhat uh, entity, a for a school entity, and yeah, oh yeah, every yeah every every place you go to, you'll see the schools that are. Uh, it's getting to the point now though where you have the big schools and then anybody that's teaching small, they're teaching at a dance school or something. They're, they're share no, renting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Now my one student, he's been in the play, I think, where has he been there? 25 years? He has a school, he does Okinawan martial arts. Okay. He's been there about 25 years in the same place. We have a couple of work. And he can make it work? No, I mean, I think what it does, he just breaks even just enough. He know? sells crack on the side. He <laughs> sells jewelry on the side, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, again, it becomes, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it becomes a hobby, and, you know, you, uh, you get to the point to it's a place to train. And, again, it's socialization, you know. Yeah. And, and then he's brought in people. Uh, they're starting to do a little bit of the stick stuff, so they got a Filipino guy. I think that's the, that seems to be the model that everybody follows. You open up a fitness gym with an open area. You've got a bunch of people that are coming there to do, like, gym workouts. And then you've got a few different classes that you offer. Kali or Eskrima, something like that. You've got a boxing teacher, and you've got a BJJ coach, or you've got an MMA coach as well. And that seems to be the model that most people are following, and that's mm-hmm. like... That's like that seems to be copy and pasted uh, mm-hmm, across. Mm-hmm, but you know, it's it's sad to see so many formal chi- well martial arts formal schools just disappearing. Right. Well, we follow- got that Chan Poi. He does a uh, Walum. That yeah, Walum. He has a Walum temple in Orlando. Still going. Still it's, going. Yeah, still there. I drove past there, and he got a couple. He has one other. Uh, he has a, a student. I think he's a Chinese student. He's uh, he's about I don't know, maybe about twenty miles north of me. He has a school going there. Uh, but I, I stay pretty much to myself. Yeah. The JKD sort of in a small group. He started, you know, I haven't taught at a school or had a school for like many, many years. Yeah, you know, okay. So. Taiji, you're not looking at, uh, I mean, apart from your, for your training, some students for training partners, yeah. no, you're really. doing it for yourself. Yeah, just, yeah. Okay. I've been doing it. That, I think around 1986, I sort of burn out on the whole. I, I was, I'm starting to get kids and this and that, and I said, "Whoa!" <coughs> you know, I mean, it is a lot of hard work, though. Yeah, to yeah, teach yeah. Full time, you know. Yeah. That you're teaching all the time, and it's just like, hey, you know, you think, "Wow, I'm going to be teaching all the time," but you're working out all the time. You know, you're not. But it gets though. to the point to where you're teaching more and doing more administrative stuff, and and then your training starts, and I said, ah. so I sort of push back. You forget why you did martial arts right, in the first place. Right, right. So now it's easy. I don't belong to any organizations. I don't. You know, yeah. I don't have to deal with any of that type of stuff. So I just do it for me, <coughs> right? It's, mostly, yeah. it's actually interesting to watch how, while so many martial arts systems are struggling, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is actually taking off. Yeah, because everybody can practice it too. Again, I'm not saying it's like Taekwondo, but I mean, you've got everybody. Yeah, kids, male, kids, female, male, old, female, old people, female, everybody. Male, people that want to compete, people that don't want to compete. Me, right, exactly. 
you know, no gi, you know. But you could yeah. say that for almost any martial martial art. But they're probably the most successful. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm. They've got a good thing going for themselves, and one that they've proven their effectiveness. Well, well, that's it. So right. I think that's one thing. Uh, two, it's structured. Very structured. Yeah, right. that's the thing. I think I think that's the thing that that really. Uh, when you have someone new that comes into there, and if it's not structured and you're doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that, people just fall away. But when it's structured, they can see, well, if I go, you know, rung of a ladder, if I, yeah, can, yeah, if yeah. I can get it, I see that. I mean, they feel they can do it, you know what I mean? And uh, Instead of like, you know, this hit or miss. And a lot of people did that before. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, and then they, and then they go, oh, I can't do it, you know, where they, where they see it. Yeah, and the jiu-jitsu, I mean, it, it, it's, it's done everything, you know. It has, it's proved its effectiveness. Yeah. It's very good training, you know. Uh, I don't In terms of physical doing, exercise, physical it's a exercise. quite a good physical workout. Right, right, right. Um, well, that's the thing. When I have a, uh, one of my, uh, my son, when I start him training, uh, I put him in wrestling. I okay. put him in wrestling first. And then uh, I had him uh, at the boxing gym, but I had a boxing coach. To, I didn't. It's like you can't teach your, teach your kid how to drive, right? Yeah. So I sort of had him do that, and then uh, so uh, I taught him a little bit. But yeah, he. Uh, but f- from having that, the the, the wrestling and the, uh, boxing and some of the other stuff, he very natural that way. He you know he yeah. was never structured. I, I didn't have him structured too. Much. I mean, I started my first martial arts was judo when mm-hmm. I was five or six years old, and I did that for about two or three years. And I still recommend for that age some type of grappling art. Some type of little bit more physical, a uh, little bit more wrestling slash grappling. Right. Kind of less less theoretical, less too much detail, you know, more right. feeling right, right, and right, more, right, more right, physical right, right, and, right. And, and let them figure it out. And, then and you really can't get hurt all that at wrestling, right? No, not, and especially not, not, not at that age. Not at that age. age, same weight class, yeah. you're not getting hurt all that much. You know, that, that's the thing that I see, I see that I, sh- you know, so I always thought that if I could have it over again, right? We always look at it somewhere like that, you know. You yeah, we're, we're hind, you hindsight a, is twenty twenty, right? Yeah. You do a grappling arm. Yeah. Do a little Western boxing. Don't get hit. I mean, that's why I always tell people: don't let yourself get hit. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, if you if you're not doing it for for a living, you should not really get hit in the head all that much. You know what I mean? So, and it does do damage to you. It's just a slower process of of, yeah. of, of, of doing things nowadays. I think if I would have to do it again, though, I would like to do some grappling type of stuff. Then just do um, some, uh, probably some like boxing and uh, Muay Thai. I think Muay Thai, the training itself, not yeah. maybe the, the whole thing, but yeah, yeah. going to the Thailand and just getting, you know, you know, jumping rope for, you know, God, uh, like, you know, like 18 rounds and then running and sparring. It's that Spartan uh-huh. type of training that yeah. the Muay Thai does. And then, you know, then everything else afterwards. But you just, I mean, like I said, my ankles, my hip. Some of my elbow hurts. I can tell that's all from training wrong. Because back then it was just like you know, figure it out as you go. <laughs> right, right. And and you see things too. We didn't have a lot. You know, we didn't have YouTube. We didn't, you didn't have the internet. You didn't have a lot of books. So it was everything was trial and error. You yeah, know what I, mean? trial and error. I quite you know for me it's I have a slightly different perspective in terms of. I mean, I know that most of the weapon work I learn in Chinese martial arts mm-hmm. is not going to be directly applicable any time in the modern times of my living. Not, not, not a big chance that I'll... <laughs> You'll have a spear anywhere? Or, or a broadsword or, you know. But personally, for me, that was, that's always been one of the key things. One, it's, it's to keep mm-hmm. something alive. Two, there's other benefits from its practice in terms of, you know, uh, other benefits. But... For me, that's actually a lot of fun. It's it's right, really right, right, interesting, right, 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 right. and I think, you know, I think that's one of its values. Really, it is. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to learning the spear more so than the straight sword. You know, at one time I, I learned a, it was the Yang, but it was the uh, what was it? Thirty-seven. It was a popular, you know, like the twenty-four. Okay, a standardized know, Yang. Standardized Yang, uh, straight sword. It's okay. Well, there's thirty-two. Or it's the 32. That yeah, one, I think okay. it was the 32. So, you know, uh, the spear's a little different. Very, very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going, you know, it is. And it's a it's right. a physical workout. It, it's if you're using a decent sized right, right, right. and decent width spear, right, 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 it's right. a workout. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's definitely a workout. A traditional spear, you know. So yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. That's that, 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 that's good. And again, it's a full body. I mean, you feel yeah, it's that. A, it's got to be whole body. Right. Otherwise, your arms right, can't right, handle right. it. And that, and that's a good thing. And again, like it says, you know, it's keeping. It's keeping your tradition alive, you know. Yeah. What are you looking to learn this time? I mean, you've arrived yesterday. Uh, let's see what I learn. I, I just go. I, I'm to the point now. I just I'll do the push hands, do the form, 16 posture form, and just say whatever you want me to learn. That's how I'm pretty. That's much. That's a good attitude. That's how, I, how yeah. I've always been. Well, what do you think I'm? A, you're the teacher. Tell me what I want. I mean, that's how I've always approached my right, teacher, right, my right. training with my teacher. Right. I mean, I we always get foreigners that come through or people that don't live here and they'll come and train with him. I want this, this, I want this, 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 this. I'm like, this is Pizza Hut's down the road. <laughs> down the road. Here, you'll learn whatever he wants to teach you. That's right, what right, right, right. But my teacher is slightly, you know, accommodating to, to understand, okay, right, right, you know, right, right. if they're ready or right. even close to ready, maybe he'll, he'll, he'll accommodate there. But having this attitude is the right attitude. You'll learn what you need to learn when you, when need, you to need, learn. need to learn. It, right. And if you trust your teacher, as right, in he's right, got a good right, character, right. good personality, and good skill, right. he's not gonna he's not gonna mess you around. He knows this. Right. So yeah, he knows what I'm ready for. Right. Again, right. You know, so. Well, I mean, it's been a good chat. I mean, are there any last things you want to share with the listeners out there? Is there a way that people can contact you if anybody's yeah, in your Facebook neighborhood? Facebook or uh, what is the name of your your uh, Orchid Island? Tai Chi Research Institute. Because my okay. thing is, that's what I try to do. When I come here to China, it's to research for my oh, personal right. thing. You know what I mean? We didn't talk about that. You were uh, writing a book. Yeah. Uh, I'm putting together. I thought it was going to be a lot easier. Than yeah, it it's never as easy as you <laughs> think a book. <laughs> so I've been doing some, uh, you know, some uh, interviews with some of the people. Uh, like your, uh, uh, two of your Kung Fu uncles. Uh, okay. Joe uh, Dian. Uh, Wang Tong. Wang Tong and Zhao Dai Yuan. You interviewed them. And uh, Kang Wu. Okay, Kang Wu, uh, yeah. Who was fun, uh, very, very nice. Oh, they all were. They all were. Kang yeah. Wu was very good. Uh, and some of that was based upon, I, it was my own personal, you know, you hear all this stuff on the internet. This guy did this, and Dong Hai Chuan that, and Bog was like this. I go to the, that's one of my main things. Yeah, go to the go source. Go to the source. Right. Like when I went to learn JKD, it's me, like Ted Wong's the source. You know? Yeah. You learn the Tai Chi or something like Zhang Yun and, and, and Lu Shanley, they're the source. Yeah. You're going to get the information because their source is the other source. Right. Like the Wong Pei Shangs and the Bruce Lee, et cetera. So on and so forth. So, like, so that, that, that's why. So I went there and, and, and heard information from them and then. Uh, uh, went to uh, Yongnian, you know. Yongnian, yeah, okay. In Guangfu. Right, and then I got to see. Uh, now, I I have met this uh, Taoist uh, master at the White Cloud Temple. Okay. Okay, he's been there. Uh, he's been there about 40 some years. Is that all? <laughs> so I've been. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, he was at the one for 20. He started like. He went to the first temple. In, uh, what is that? Uh, Lo, Lo Shan, La, La, where was it originally? Lao Shan? Yeah, yeah. Lao Shan, but it's in the in, in, in the south. Yeah, okay, right, right. a little bit. Little he was south. there for twenty years, then he came here. He's been he's been at the White Cloud Temple for about twenty five years. Wow. So he yeah he started like when he was very young as an initiative, and I met him and he taught me some uh, like qigong, okay, qigong stuff and some uh, Dao Yin kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, Dao Yin right? stuff yeah. and uh, Yang Yang Sheng. Yeah, Yang Sheng just means health the, or health the, cultivation. Yeah, well, the tai, like Yang Sheng Tai Chi, right? Like okay. Stuff. It's a little weird, right? So uh, there, and then so now I'm going to interview him. I'm going to ask, uh, talk a little him a little bit more about like um, the structure of the temple. You know how it's structured, why it's structured the way it is. The White Cloud Temple. Mm -hmm. There were like people, like like uh, people that were just passing through, or on this side, people that were permanent. And sort of like a day in the life of a Taoist monk, what he does. Okay. You know, I'm trying to demystify a lot right. of this stuff. Right. Get down know. to the, the reality the of reality of these guys aren't all doing kung fu and secret stuff. And flying. And flying and yeah. stuff like that. They have a lot of work to do. I think, and he told me about some of his stuff. Like he has some specialties. Like he could, he did like martial arts. One of his uh, and chanting. Right? Okay. And then he has another uh, uh, like a Taoist brother that's. Very good at calligraphy. So they sort of teach each other, you know? Okay. And, nice. it's, and it's sort of funny how, how he thinks, like, you know? Because we're martial arts people, and we're always thinking about martial arts. His is like, well, that's only part of it. Mine is to become one with the Tao. He, it's like, it's important, but these other things are important, too. Like, yeah. they have a very well-balanced way. So, 
Well, that sounds him. good. Yeah, interview him, a couple other people. But who, like said, who are you still looking to interview? Do you have? Do you have? Yeah, I have him. There's another guy. Uh, there's another uh, um, Ermay Chigong guy. Okay. I'm looking at it. he's in Beijing, and that's the other thing too. It's almost like it's the Beijing group for some reason. You know, it's uh, has that. Uh, there'll probably be some other people that I, I'd like to look at, but. Um, well, what was memorable from your interviews with uh, Kango? I mean, you don't have to give too many. Oh, deals oh, he, it to uh, the book, uh, just 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 his understanding. Some of the some of the stuff that he uh, he talked about. Uh, only someone who really re- researched it and went could know some of those things right. you know, that he that he knew, and uh, just. Uh, it was, it was unbelievable. I mean, he was talking about like, you know, he's talking about Dong Hai Chuan, like coming across a corner, like coming around the corner, you know, with 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 the tea and stuff. It's like sort of how like the the changes came along. And ah. stuff like that. It, he has some of that, and then uh, you know, he he, he uh, says that he's the founder of it. No, for was, sure, he's always it, said that it, through it, his research. In this, right, right, yeah, right. yeah. And he, he makes the most sound <laughs> argument. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And it's not based on pulling something out of his ass. It's pulling. Right. It's like looking at everything he could possibly look at. Right. And that's his conclusion, and he can say why. And, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, he's always been... I mean, he's a close friend of my teachers, too. Right, right. He spent a lot of time with my family when he's researching uh, right, Bagua. Right. So What they ended up in getting Dong Hai Chuan's... Uh, uh, coughing and opening yeah, up and getting, his tomb and, getting and his measuring tomb. stuff measuring stuff measuring right. bones I mean the thing had been robbed already but right, and the right. bones were there right, so right. yeah yeah yeah. I got to see the original uh, uh, the site where his, uh, where the, his yeah, burial yeah, yeah. it's a, toma- a tomato plantation it was oh it was at that time yeah at that time and yeah then I guess yeah so I got to see that so that was I thought it was corn at first but I remember it was tomatoes so That's different right. vegetable yeah, so one of the things... See, the tomato's round, so it kind of fits oh, with the so circle work. Oh, circle right there. <laughs> so that was good. And then uh, who else we interviewed? We interviewed... Um, oh, what's that guy's name? Wang Deming. Ah, okay, yes. He has a nicer school... Sun student. Jun student. Right, Sun yeah. Jun. But he's very much focused on sport wushu, entertainment, and he did, of course... Sun he Jun does the traditional yeah, stuff, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think yeah, he had some he had some pretty unique training devices. He had a, a big, solid stone ball okay. that he had on a table, and then just he rolling it a, around. Yeah, he'd use you know he'd be doing the yang, you know, just pushing it. Ah, oh, okay. The tai Chi, yeah. Tai Chi. Okay. He had a real nice school. He had a real. Uh, I've been to his school. Before. Oh, you had that, and then he got an auditorium in the back. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh my god. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He teaches a lot of kids. Right, uh, but it's the only right, way now. Right, 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 right. right. He it's the only way. He teaches so. a lot of kids. He was very nice. Everybody seemed to be very nice. They're very nice. Wang Tong, Wang Tong, yeah, he's very nice. Yeah, he yeah, smokes you know a lot. Funny? Well, he was funny. <laughs> I was telling, I was telling, all these masters smoke, right? So I was going like this. <laughs> Single palm change. All oh, right, exactly. <laughs> Splitting. <laughs> That's the one thing. You know, like I was saying, when we have tomb, f- tomb, tomb, tomb sweeping festival, then we go to the restaurant. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm breathing like secondhand smoke of twenty packs of cigarettes in one day. You think about all these people. They're these, these enlightened masters of these so-called health practices, and we're getting shit faced and smoking. They're all smoking cigarettes like chain smoking. Oh it's, man, it was, so, yeah. it was so funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, by the way, the person who's speaking in the right. background is uh, Neil. Neil, he's, he's, uh, he's my also, little kung fu brother. He's yeah, he's Bill's kung fu brother here. He's also somebody he's trained with my master too. A right, little right, bit. Right. So we're all kind of related, and uh, yeah. So yes, hi, hi, Choyan. Yeah. He's asking if my teacher Di Guoyong still smokes cigarettes. Uh, very seldom, maybe right. three or four a day at most. So yeah. Which is good. I, yeah, that's enough. You know? yeah. no, I guess that was a thing to do, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a social thing. That's right, why right, we, right, for right. that generation, it was a social thing. So, right, well, right. What, what about the, the prospects of finishing this book? Uh, it always m- morphs a little bit, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, there was somebody that was, I think that I read about, uh, John Blofeld. Okay. That he wrote, he was, uh, he was in China in the 1930s. And oh, okay, I know. He was English. He came here in the 1930s. Can't recall his name, he, but I remember. Yeah, he, he wrote, he, he became a pretty high-level Buddhist, lived in Thailand. But he was here in the 30s. He left, 
during a Japanese sort of during a Japanese occupation. Then he came back in the forties again. Then he left in nineteen forty nine. But he writes about like it's sort of like the romantic things about you know China here, and he has some pretty good books on. Uh, okay. You know, he he went and visited Taoist, and he went and, and and that's sort of the things that I, I I do too when I come back to Beijing. I sort of read through his books and see these see if these areas still exist. Okay. You know what I mean? See if these temples are still still around, there. They're still there. Or, you know, like today, what temple did I go? Gongji, Gongji Guan, the temple I went to. Uh, no, the other one near my uh, near my hotel today. Oh, it was a monastery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I was, was that in one of his books? Huh? No, I just uh, it's, uh, he does outline a bunch of uh, things. Oh. There. But he went in like Sichuan province, yeah. and he was here doing like you know smoked opium, did this, okay, all the all the little pleasurable things that you did in Beijing back then. So he sort of has that. Then he did travel and went to a lot of Buddha. He wrote a lot of books on Buddhism and, and, and a couple of really good books on Taoism. Two books on Have Taoism. you read Red Pine stuff? Uh, actually, Bill Red Porter? Pine learned from him. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay, because yeah. Red Pine is doing did the same thing. Right, right. What did what? Um, he wrote that book where he tra- He went around Huashan. Right. And found all the hermits. And all the hermits, them. right. Yeah, interviewed right, right, them. Right. So, yeah, your, so those guys, yeah, sort of, the, that's sort of how now it's like morphing into like, sort of like, you're on, you find these different people, these uh, people that are seekers in a sense of different, yeah. different things, you know, like the religious thing. Like today I went, I went, I went, I went to, I haven't been to church in a long time, but I went to a Chinese church today, right now. Really? Yeah, I went to Christian a, church? Christian church. It's been there 120 years, I think. This okay, one, interesting. One Christian. So I like the, his, uh, the history of the Beijing. Oh, right, you know? right, right, right. So, that, so your yeah. book is, you don't know what... No, no, no. It's sort of getting to be now my... Ju- First it was going to be like more or less interview this guy, this is the truth, you know, yeah. this is the bad bog, blah, blah, blah. Now it's sort of like my adventure. You know, okay, well, that's mind. also good. Right, right, right. I mean, that's right. like Bill Porter. Right, right, right. right. Uh, Red Pine, same right, guy. Right. And I really enjoy, I've got all of his books, basically. Right. I've even got his translation of sutras, which are phenomenal. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, very good stuff. And that's the thing, too. I think in the martial arts, you start to go that, you just start to go that direction, more of a, I don't want to say spiritual, but more of a, uh, of a, of a, of a personal oh, well it is martial arts martial is a personal, personal, personal journey personal journey right? yeah, that's good that's good yeah, that's well good. I'm looking forward to it whenever you release it so yeah. okay well it's been really good talking okay. to you okay. and uh, good luck with your with your training yeah. and uh, well you know we'll Just be in touch anyway alright alright